Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks on Saturday, February 8th, 2014. This is episode 1055. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, or other Apple product is worth at gazelle.com. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers and the internet, home theater, smartphones, you know, all that jazz, all the technology that's changing our lives and our work and our play and our everything. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the number if you want to talk about it. If you want to ask a question, make a comment, make a suggestion, I'd love to hear from you. 888 827 Five five three six, toll free from anywhere in uh, the U.S. or Canada. Otherwise, you can use Skype to call us. I didn't see this. Did you see the NBC report uh, on Friday on the fourth, which would be what uh, I don't know Tuesday, a couple of days before the launch of the Olympics? NBC had uh, correspondent Richard Engel claiming if you bring your mobile phone or laptop to the Sochi Olympics, it will be hacked the minute you turn it on. The story was entirely faked. Entirely faked. So I wanted to come on here, because I know a lot of you are interested in technology, and perhaps some of you were spooked by this idea, or maybe I think really the whole idea is to gleefully rub your hands with relish. You see, Russia's a dangerous place. You can get hacked the moment you turn on your laptop. Except it's all wrong. So we've seen a couple of one, uh, a couple of stories now. One from the guy who set it up, saying, uh, explaining what really was set up. And I guess the most important point is the things that they demonstrated, which were essentially taking a computer out of the box, not doing any updates. Okay, you know, if you listen to this show, red light number one, not doing any updates putting it online, and then going to known bad sites. Now, it turns out in Russia, if you Google the Olympics, the results will come up higher with Russian sites, which many of which are, you know, malicious, admittedly. He then surfs the sites, downloads software from the sites or downloads something from the sites and opens it up, activates it. Now, they cut out that part, by the way. So it looked as if just turning on the computer, you got hacked. What they didn't show was Richard Engel downloading and installing the stuff. Oh, they also didn't mention he wasn't in Sochi. He was in Moscow, a thousand miles away. It's the websites. As you know, it's the websites, which you could easily go to anywhere else, including right now from your living room. The results would have been the same anywhere in the world. Then they demonstrated how his Android phone got hacked. Oh, my gosh. What they didn't show, what they edited out, was Richard Engel intentionally downloading a malicious app. And in order to do that, by the way, he had to un, you know, check that box that says, is it okay to download apps from unknown parties? Yes. So he checks that. They don't show this. Checks that box, then goes to a known bad site. So he disabled the security, downloaded malware, and ran it. And all of this could be done, of course, from your own home. The advice has always been the same, whether you're in Sochi, Moscow, or here, wherever here might be. You don't go to malicious sites. You don't download software. You do run your updates. You patch your browser. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I'd expected more from, uh, frankly, from uh, NBC. But this is so sensationalistic, right? It's so, it's such great, it's such great news. And this is, you know, people are frequently now, you'll hear people go, oh, you know, you can't trust the blogosphere. You got to trust trusted news sources. These, you know, we don't know. Uh, you read a blog, you don't know what the, you know, who's paying for it and what. You hear a lot about that lately. 
I guess what we really know is that trusted sources weren't always so trusted either. In this case, I would say NBC News should be trusted, but no. Outrageous. Outrageous. So now you know, and uh, you. But if, see, if you've listened to the show, you've known all along. <laughs> you don't do those things, and it doesn't matter if you're in Sochi or Moscow or anywhere. You just don't do those things because you're gonna get hacked. I guess he could have. It may have been. Might have been a more useful story, frankly, if he'd said something like, "You know, you can get hacked easily if you do these stupid things." And maybe I would have said, "Hey, that's good." But they edited out all the uh, all the important stuff because then it's not the same story. What they wanted to imply was you turn a computer on in Sochi and you'll be hacked immediately. And it's not true. Not true. Truly amazing. Uh, let's see. What else is uh, <laughs> that one? That one just caught my eye. Did you see the dying tweets of China's moon rover? This was kind of sad. Kind of like Wall-E. <laughs> China's uh, Jade Rabbit, the first Chinese moon rover, landed on the moon. It apparently has had a technical malfunction, and they expect it to die in space. They can't retract the solar panels during the two-week lunar night, and they're afraid that it will. It will basically the batteries will die. It'll just it will just go away. But the, but the, but the Jade Rabbit has its own Twitter account. Uh, and it's, it's kind of beautiful. <laughs> he says, although I should have, this is, this is the lunar rover, supposedly. Although I should have gone to bed this morning, my master's discovered something abnormal with my mechanical control system. They're staying up all night working for a solution. I heard their eyes are looking more like my red rabbit eyes. Nevertheless, I'm aware I may not survive this lunar night. Oh, I, that's obviously not a tweet. It's a little too long for a tweet. It's just, I don't know what it is. I'll see if I can find what, what they were talking about. Then the next one is, if this journey, maybe it's a blog post. If this journey must come to an end, <laughs> I'm not afraid whether or not the repairs are successful. I believe even my malfunctions will provide my masters with valuable information and experience. Then he says, the sun is already set here. The temperature is falling very quickly. I've said a lot today, and I feel it's not enough. I'll tell everyone a secret. Actually, I'm not feeling especially sad. Just like any other hero, I've only encountered a little problem while on my own adventure. And then it's last, presumably it's last, since we won't know until the lunar week, week uh, night is over. It's, it's last tweet. Good night, planet Earth. Good night, humanity. Oh, little Wally. <laughs> um, it's, it's supposed to hibernate during the lunar night because there'll be no sunlight on it. It gets very, very cold, but because it wasn't able to c close the solar panels, it's vulnerable, and uh, Ch the Chinese scientists are worried it may not make it back. Maybe, you know, maybe those are tweets, and just because it's in Chinese, you know, 140 characters in Chinese, that could be a book. Maybe that's it. Anyway, very, very sweet. This is a tradition that NASA started of the, of the rovers and so forth tweeting as if they're alive. That's nice. That's nice. Uh, let's see. There's a new app out called Secret. It seems to be a popular app category all of a sudden. There was one before it called Whisper. In, in, in secret, it's for iOS only. It's hard to find because if you search for secret, it's like the 120th secret down. But, <laughs> but uh, that's probably appropriate because secret allows your friends to post anonymously, post secrets. Ooh. But you can't just search for secret if you want to try this. You, if you search for, the best thing to do is search for uh, secret speak freely on the App Store. It's iOS only. Secret speak freely. And uh, then you can post your secrets anonymously. Except you know if it's somebody in your address book. So that's even more fun.
You don't know who, but you know it's somebody in your address book. Le Ooh, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls right after this. Secret. Yeah, if you <laughs> should mention that. It's not really secret. Oh, I was going to talk about Tim Cook with his... God, he knows how to get the press. He says, we're definitely launching new product categories this year. And the world goes crazy. But I heard on Secret, one of my, apparently somebody that I follow, uh, somebody in my contact list on Secret is working on this, whatever it is. And I thought it would be the watch, and it may be the watch. He said categories. It might be two products. One is a living room product. Okay. And I saw the Flappy Bird tip. Beat Flappy Bird. Gary, I saw that one already. Somebody tweeted it to me. If you have to take care of legal matters, <laughs> Do you play Flappy Bird? I should talk about this. Hey folks, this is a quick tutorial on how to cheat and beat the very popular Flappy Bird game. I've been playing it for about a week now, Watch and carefully. it has totally consumed my life. Is this Marquez um, Brownlee? The concept seems pretty no. simple at first. Uh, you just sort of tap the screen to keep the bird alive, Have you played this game? going through the obstacles without so touching addictive. anything. And of course, I'm sure as you know, that is a lot easier said than done. Uh, but if I can do it, trust me folks, you can do it. So. I'll just jump right in here and pay attention to the technique that I use. It's really about the technique on beating this game. So I'll start off and just pay attention because uh, you can miss it. See right there? <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to beat Flappy Bird. Hit it some more. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah, that's the way you beat Flappy Bird. <laughs> Have you played it yet? Oh, God. Oh, God. It's so hard. Have you played Flappy Bird? No? How'd you, how'd you miss Flappy Bird? So the best part of Flappy Bird is the sound. Make sure the sound is turned up because it's fun. So the idea is you tap to flap. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. That's not an auspicious Good beginning. Good start. I got a zero. <laughs> That's bad. There's somebody here. Uh, Josh has like, oh, Josh has like 42. You crush it between those things? No, you're not. You're supposed to miss everything. Oh, That's I'm, all you have to do. It's I'm, very simple. I'd be wanting to pinch right there. Pinch. Mm. <laughs> mm. Oh, I don't want to share that score. Thank you. I should, I should share. I found a new way to get zero on Flappy Bird. Let oh me share God. that. Let me just share that score. <laughs> you know I don't play games. <laughs> Why not? That's what life's all about is playing games. You have 69, Bert? 83? Whoa. Who's got the highest flappy bird in here? Anybody beat 83? Street Racer 84. Now, don't lie now. Tell the truth. 55? How long do you have to play? <laughs> I do not care about rating Fox Noise sucks, period. We didn't talk about Fox Noise at all, I think, in the last day or so. So I don't know what you're talking about. That was NBC. 69 is a one, yes. Cheaters on Floppy Bird scoreboard. Charles Robinson, huh? Is he got the, is he at the record? Thing is, I don't trust a picture too much because you could, oh no. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888, 88, ask Leo. That's the phone number. 888-826, let's see, 888 888-826-5527. Flappy birds. We were talking about flappy birds. You don't game, huh? Heather Hammond, our phone ranger, is not a gamer. <laughs> it is. I don't understand why it has taken the world by storm. A week ago, when we were talking a week ago, flappy birds was just coming out on the app store. Uh, 
And today it is probably it is easily the number one app in 12 countries around the world on Android and iOS. It is annoyingly simple. You just flap the bird. But I've been looking because I can't, you know, I just got zero. I was playing it. I just, I got, it's hard. My friend Paul Therat is current Flappy Bird champion. Not a surprise. He has 118 points. That is mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. It drops off fast. Carl Anderson, 75. Daniel Durham, 18. Jordy Seinfeld, 12. Michael Blake, 9. Justin Young, 9. <laughs> Patrick Beja, 4. Chris Perillo, 2. Me, 2. <laughs> Maybe the people with 2 are people who had the smarts to say, I'm not playing any more Flappy Bird. It's interesting because this company is making bank. And, and Flappy Bird is free. And uh, there's no in-app purchases, which I think is one of the reasons it's popular. It's extremely simple. All you do is you tap the screen to make the bird flap and then avoid obstacles, which is not easy. It's an 8-bit game, and, you know, it's all kind of blocky. People seem to like that. It's, it's a fascinating story. It was created by a guy, a Vietnamese developer named Dong Nguyen, with a company called Dot Gears. He hasn't given, he hasn't said anything about this. In fact, the last time he gave an interview was in January, before Flappy Birds came out, in which he said, mobile games are too complicated, and he wanted to make something simple. Well, he did. He did. It is hugely successful, and they're making literally hundreds of thousands of dollars a day on the ads. On the ads alone. So I say this mostly in warning. Do not, if you have not installed Flappy Birds, do not. <laughs> do not install it. And if you have, quick, delete it. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number. Did you, Heather, should I? I think I should go right to the phones. Oh, yeah. Should I start? Who? Who should I start with? I see Definitely a, Joe in Orlando, Joe Orlando. Okay. who has a shiny new computer. Yay. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Hey, Leo, it's Joe, WX4DX in Orlando. Good afternoon. Hello, WX4DX. This is W6TWT reporting in for duty. I have a brand new iMac 27 out of the box, and it's my first Mac since, I don't know, 1977, back when it was like Apple One, Apple Two. And I wanted to ask your opinion about the best hard drive to use for backup purposes and the best way to do that. Do I need USB 3.0? Do I need, what is really the best way to go ahead and back this up through the time machine on Mac since this is all new to me? USB 3.0 is very fast. Newer Macs now have this Thunderbolt port, but no, uh, but the Thunderbolt drives, and there are very, very few of them, I think one, maybe two, are extraordinarily expensive. Uh, so you don't need it unless you need a lot of speed. I would stick with just USB 3.0, which is extremely fast, more than fast enough for backup. And, the, and, and affordable, if you go to the big box stores, you'll see a ton of them. And you can get anything because uh, all of them are formatted so that they can be read on Macs and PCs. Apples do not read the modern Windows file format. and It's called NTFS. They can't read it. Uh, but no, but nobody's selling these drives formats it as NTFS. They format it as uh, FAT or extended FAT, and that's fine. So if I went with a with like a Western Digital, perfect. I need to like a two terabyte. Should it have AC power? Is that important? It's better if it does. Out? The ones that don't will be slower. Okay. Uh, in order to, to this, they call that bus powered. It's powered by the USB cord. Uh, in order to do that, they have to have 5400 RPM lower power drives, and they're generally smaller as well. So uh, if it's just for the desktop, right? I mean, you're not going anywhere with it, or are you? That's correct. Just the yeah. desktop yeah. for work. I do voiceover, so it's going to be used just for Good. you know doing doing audio. Perfect. And another thing you might look at is a program called Super Duper. Okay. Um, Time Machine is the built-in backup Apple provides it. And it works very nicely, but Super Duper you can be used in conjunction with Time Machine to make a bootable backup. So should your internal drive die in entirely, you could then boot up from that external drive. And that's Excellent nice. advice. I love it. Yeah, that's very nice. Especially when you, it's working on that right away. Yeah. All right, Joe. What kind Thank of voiceover you, do you do? What, you as always. What kind of voiceover do you do? I do Christian voiceover here in Orlando for uh, local FM station to support churches. Do you, that's a great gig, and you can do it from the house. That's really nice. I do. Yeah, yeah. with my Heil PR40, which I love. <laughs> Bob, Bob Heil's a great man. He's been very good to me over the years. Me too. Uh, I won my first. 
This is the mic I use, the Heil PR40 from HeilSounds.com. The first PR40 I won as the podcast of the year back when podcasting was first starting in 2006. And then I liked it so much I bought some more. And then Bob has been very generous with uh, with supplying us with them. I guess, you know, it's a little bit of a plug when you see it on camera. But we love them. We love them. Hey, thanks, yeah, I Joe. You today. We had our big ham fest here in Orlando, and I thought you about my brand oh. new unit in trunk tracker scanner. I'm really big into radio scanning. I love public safety and aircraft. So today's ham fest day for the year, so it's always a great day. Have a great day, Joe. 7 3. You too, 7 3. Thanks. Take care. Yeah, Bob Heil is an interesting story. He was a sound guy. He actually started, he was an electronics guy in Missouri. And uh, I can't remember what the band was. Was it the Grateful Dead? One of the bands was in town having trouble with their equipment. They went over. They said, can you help us? The sounds, you know, something shorted or whatever. He got into rock and roll sound, did the Grateful Dead sound, did the Who's sound, designed the Quadrophenia four-track sound, four-channel sound in uh, the live concert performances for the Who. Did the squawk box for Peter Frampton, you know. And then got into microphones because he was a ham. And uh, he designed ham microphones for years, finally realized the professional audio uh, for... Uh, not just for uh, rock and roll, but for radio and, and others, uh, wasn't, you know, the microphones are expensive, not very good. He designed his first studio mic, the Heil PR40, which is what I use. And uh, just, the problem is, I don't tell the radio stations that's what I use because they're too inexpensive. They're only 350 bucks. And I can't possibly be, <laughs> I can't possibly be a good mic. How can that be a good mic? You can't use that. Speaking of good mics, Mike in Portland, Maine, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo, it is so great to be able to talk to you, and I've got some good news for you. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about it or not. Did Heather mention it to you? No. Well, you know, you weren't on here in Maine for the longest time, up in Portland anyway. Yeah. But the big talk radio station here in Portland has finally put you on both Saturday and Sunday. Oh, and, a double uh, threat. You, That's awesome. You're not on live, you know, you're a couple hours delayed, but you're on, you know, within a couple hours of when you're usually on. And even, I think, better news, especially for tech people that like to learn about things, they put you on and they pulled Kim Commando. <laughs> we, <laughs> we like that. What's the call sign? Uh, WGAN. Hello, WGAN. Thank you for your excellent taste. They have great taste. Mike, hang on the line. We're going to get to you next. Leo okay. Laporte, the tech guy. I bet you, I bet you, board ops all over the country are playing Flappy Bird. Right now, as we speak. Yeah. Should I try it? I just Sarah Jane UK said something like, "I just don't have time, my projects and everything." And I'm like, "Yeah, I mean, It'll I could say I don't have It'll time." It'll make you crazy. This but, is my game. Is uh, quiz up? I love this game. Uh oh. I think this it's that I like. prefer when I waste this my is, time to waste it on other this, things. Yeah, this is not a time waster. <laughs> this is a trivia game. It's really fun. Should we play a little bit here? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to play. They have a lot of categories. Are you good at Selena Gomez or Taylor Swift? Let's not do no. that. <laughs> These are ones I've played. Let's do tech since we're the tech guy. Uh -oh. and now now you can challenge one of your friends uh, or you can just say, I'll play anybody in the in the quiz up a verse. Oh, and cool. so it's going to pick somebody and we're going to play live. This is Domingo. He's in the Netherlands. And this and is using gonna... Facebook or Google Plus? No, no, it's an app. But Round one. Are you ready? Okay. What is the oldest digital library? Digital library in the world? I'd say it's Project Gutenberg. Oh, you can't see, so let me, I guess, show you all. And I got that right. He did not. What does the name Samsung mean? Holy cow. I think three stars. That's right. Sam, E R Sansu, Wu Liu Chi Ba Jo. Oh, good job. Yeah. Which company invented the word processor? I'm going to say Wang, but it's not in there. So it'd have to be IBM. Yeah. <laughs> so we're neck and neck. By the way, it gives you a certain amount of time. In which year did Tim Berners-Lee introduce the phrase World Wide Web? <gasps> oh, it was uh, 19... Oh, it got to be 85? No? 80? 90? Wow. Oh, I got that one wrong. I think it was 89, I thought. But anyway, because they could change the font size, early adopters of the tech toy tended to be over 40. What? Kindle. All right. All right, round six. Here we go. Which image editing software was created by LifeScape and later acquired by Google in 2004? I think that has to be Photoscape. No, it's Picasso. Yikes. Uh -oh. He's coming up strong. The last round's double points. Let's do it. What is YouTube's <laughs> annual short film competition called? It's called... I don't know. 
You direct. You direct? That's what I would have guessed. Fortunately, he got it wrong. So I win by 10 points. That was a close one. Wow. Isn't that fun? <laughs> Hi, Scott. Some other so Domingo hey, wants a rematch. You're, so let's have a rematch. You're having too much fun here. Let's have a rematch. Domingo says, wait a minute. That wasn't fair. I got a lot wrong. I'm going to get it right this time. I'm going to get every one of them right. You ready? Round one. Scott, do me a favor and talk for me. Which for country uses its domain test name one, as a major sort of income? That's two. Okay. Tuvalu. It's right TV. Okay. So I got 20 points, which is the max you can get timer-wise. See the clock up top. Which company created the game Angry Birds Rovio? Of course. And we got that one also in 20. So this guy's in deep trouble now because I'm, I've decided to whip his butt. Who discovered the first computer bug? Of course, they're going to say it is Grace Hopper. Grace Murray. Grace Hopper, yeah. Yep. Took me up. I lost a point for taking too long on that one. Oh. Which company developed the web browser called Brom? That's Google. Okay, I got... Uh, I got uh, say I'm, something against Scott. Test okay. one, two, okay, three. Okay. That's good. Are Which company developed yep. the Finical, the Thank core you. banking software called Finical. I'm going to say Infosys. All right, so far so good. This guy's sorry he challenged me. He forgot. He doesn't realize he's running. It. Of course, that would be Al Gore. He doesn't yeah. realize he's playing the tech guy in the tech category. It really isn't fair. <laughs> Last round, double, double. Emails you sign to get, but read aren't spam, but known by what other meaty word? Bacon. <laughs> All right. I didn't I, know that. So I think I trounced this fellow. So everything is always him. a lightning round? It's what? all lightning round all the wow. time. Wow. Now, the, what's, no, I'm not going to play any more, Domingo. You should learn. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to show you topics. So this nice is, this is the, this game has more topics. Oh, we got to play Ooh, now. Ooh, TV, man. I, I'm all over that one. Thank you. Oh, I better open this one because it's weird. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. He's Scott Wilkinson. The home theater guy, our home theater guru, joins us each and every week to talk about big screen TV, surround sound, and the like. Hi, Scott. Hey, Leo. How's it going? Welcome. Thank you so much. Did you watch the opening ceremonies last night? Uh, I missed the uh, the cheese. I only saw the uh, ath the athletes entering. Oh, How I, I was skip it? over that. I skip over. Well, that. it goes on and on and on. But I, but oh, I, yeah. you know, I I missed well, the beginning. Know. It was it wasn't that long, I guess. Uh, well, if you don't count the uh, athletes coming in, yeah, it wasn't all that long. Yeah, because I uh, missed the, the beginning, yeah. You know, there was a bug. Uh, the, they had these snowflakes that were supposed to expand into the rings, and one of them didn't. Did you hear about that? No, what happened? Oh, it, it's these, these suspended giant things. Like they look like snowflakes, and yeah. then they sort of, you know, expanded out into the five Olympic rings, but one of them didn't. Uh -oh. And I had heard a rumor, I have no idea if it's true or not, that Vladimir Putin tried to get uh, NBC to Photoshop it so it looked oh, correct that on the right. rebroadcast. That <laughs> sounds right. Can you f please, can you fix it? Yes, He's exactly. Wrong. He's wrong. I was surprised to see Putin wearing a shirt, actually, in the... In the <laughs> <laughs> podium there. There seem to be a lot of pictures before the Olympics of him topless. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know. He wants to be a he-man, I guess. One of the coolest things about the opening ceremonies, though, was they had this gigantic projection system that projected... By the way, I now understand the... this has been a whole internet meme of four rings in a snowflake. Now I understand yes. the meme. Yes. All right, go four ahead. Inter four rings and a snowflake. Yes. And and they didn't. NBC didn't do it. We saw it on the on the uh, rebroadcast at eight o'clock. I'll Pacific go back last now. Night. The good news, of course, it it happened live in the morning, and this is the problem with the Olympics, yeah. and especially yeah. when they're on the other side of the world. For us in the U.S., we miss right. the live stuff. But on demand, uh, I can watch everything. So I'll go back exactly. and I'll watch the the ring not not, not open. Not open. <laughs> yeah. But the coolest thing I think was that on the. Uh, floor of the of the stadium which by the way was built only for the opening ceremonies and the closing ceremonies they built an entire stadium just for that um but on the floor where all of the opening ceremony stuff happened they had a, a, it was basically a gigantic projection screen and they had 120 projectors suspended up on the ceiling someplace uh <clears throat> All totally edge blended. Yeah, there it is. You, you can see it the in the image there. The one well, nobody one, can see it because we're on the radio. But go we're ahead. on the radio. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at it. <laughs> anyway, um, so they have 120 projectors up on the ceiling, pointing down to the floor, and they're all what's called edge blended. So it looks like one continuous gigantic projected image, 
and it was beautiful. Uh, they had images of, of ships sailing along with people walking along with them. And I was thinking, my God, that, that must be very disorienting to walk along as if you're sort of on the deck of a ship that's actually moving. But it's not. Uh, it's just a projection. But it's not. Yeah, it's a projection. Yeah. It was very strange. Uh, and during the uh, procession of the Olympians, um, they had a, they came out, sort of came out of the floor. And uh, when each country came out, the picture of that country on the globe was projected onto the floor. So it looked like they were coming out of their own country. It was really cool. I imagine that you watch things like this very differently from the rest of us. <laughs> You're looking at the technology being used, the projectors, I am. the video. Yes, and all of yes, that. yes. I yes. I often wonder about this that that video reviewers such as myself, you know, when we're watching something on TV, you know, are we we're looking for different things. Uh, just like as a musician, I listen to music probably yeah. differently than yeah. non-musician. Yeah. You know, I'm listening for now, technique and intonation and stuff like that. Now, what TV did you watch this on? I was watching it on an Epson 520 projector. Ah, that must. How big was the screen? Well, it's not that big. It's you don't a have 120 60, foot. 120 no, foot I don't. I have, <laughs> I have a 60, 64 inch diagonal That's screen. That's but I'm not, only sitting. I'm only sitting eight feet away. I think people who have projectors, and I include myself in this, tend to try to get it as big as possible, but that dilutes the brightness of the image. Correct. And degrades Correct. it a little bit, frankly. I bet you it looks well, better at 60 <clears> inches than it would at 110. It depends. It all depends on how much light the projector can put out. Um, yeah, at 60 inches, it, for me, it's a matter of the relationship between the screen size and the seating distance. Right. If you've got the right distance for the screen size, uh, then you're going to get the best possible picture. Now, the smaller the image, of course, the, the brighter it's going to be. You're exactly right about that. But also the higher the black level. Right. So it's not going to look as deep as, as, oh. as poppy. Okay. As if it were on a bigger screen. Of course, then you on a bigger screen, you don't have the, the high brightness either. So right. it's a trade-off. And you want to try and find that happy medium. I, I think I have. I'm, in, uh, I'm also in what's called the low or eco lamp mode. So the lamp is not putting out as much light because it's a relatively small screen. We're starting to see LED projectors. The, uh, oh, yeah. The advantage being that the, they don't burn out as fast, so the cost of buying a new bulb is minimized. But... Are right. they as good? People keep asking me, and I actually been well. Rem they're trying not to remember to ask you. They're not as bright. Yeah. Yeah. They're not as bright as lamp-based projectors. So you can't put them on as as big a screen as we yeah. were just talking about. Um, but they last tens of thousands of hours without having to replace the bulb, and the bulb is you know hundreds of dollars right. each time. Now at ISE Integrated Systems Europe, this. Uh, show in Europe that was just in Amsterdam last weekend, the uh, digital projection showed a laser illuminated projector that could put out 12,000 lumens. I mean, that's that's basically a huge amount of light. And they claim that it'll last 20,000 hours. Now, oh. if you were to put a bulb, you know, have to replace the bulb in a digital cinema projector, which is sort of what this is, not exactly, but sort of, you know, you'd, you'd end up spending, spending $40,000 on lamps, just on lamps, over 20,000 hours of use. And this thing is supposed to cost $45,000, which is a lot of money, but it's not when you consider what you're getting. Right. In fact, um, I got a letter from uh, an email from a guy who wanted to get an LED projector, as you were talking about, right. but he only wanted to spend $1,000. And uh, I'm, I have to tell him, sorry, you're not going to get an LED is projector. There, well, you, is there any other will, reason? Because the bulbs are getting, I mean, bulbs are down to 50 bucks now. So, you, I mean, it's crazy to spend 1000 bucks just to save money on bulbs or spend well, more just to save money on bulbs. But is there another reason? Is LED better for other reasons? Well, yes, in the sense that it remains more stable. Bulbs... Uh, uh, Lamps can degrade over time, and they do. They degrade over time. LEDs do too, but much, much more slowly. Uh. So you end up with a much more consistent picture for a much longer time. Um, so that's that's the reason to one of the reasons to do that. Um, and they also run a lot cooler. So if you do have a heat management problem, say if you've got your projector for some reason you've had to put it inside a, a what's called a hush box, right? Uh, which uh, and and that's another reason to get an LED is that they're they don't need the fan as much, so they're not as loud. LEDs save money on power. Yep, they also save money on power. Correct. Less exactly heat means, so. of course, less power. Right. 
or right. more, and efficient more efficient use. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, a thousand dollars will get you an LED projector, but what's called a business projector, not a home theater projector. What's the difference? Well, the resolution for one thing, business projectors are typically not 1920 by 1080. Uh, their WXGA or some other computer resolution because you're expected to use a computer with them to show PowerPoint or an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. Um, <clears throat> uh, and they're very portable as well. Uh, they just don't have, they don't, and they don't care about black level. You know, we, you and I talk about black level all the time and it's really important for movies and, and on, video. Not on PowerPoint. Not on PowerPoint. Doesn't yeah. matter. So they they're not built to the same. Scott Wilkinson, editor in chief of the AVS Forum, avsforum.com, and uh, home theater geeks on the uh, radio. We'll see you later, Pot uh, uh, Scott. Pot. <laughs> you bet. We'll see you later, Leo yeah. Laporte, the tech guy. Okay, so uh, Mike Dombo in the chat room is asking, how do I like the Onkyo TX NR626? Got a good deal on it. Well, good for you. Um, I generally like Onkyo receivers very much. I have heard some people complain about reliability issues. I don't remember specifically what it was, but a couple people have have written to me and or commented on AVS forum that uh, that the reliability is a problem. I haven't experienced it myself. I don't own an Onkyo receiver, but I've reviewed them and I've had heard of, plenty of my friends have reviewed them, uh, and and they generally perform very well. Um, so good on you and congratulations. Rolando in the chat room, what do you think of the 24, 2014 Vizio TVs? Oh, when do you think they'll be available? Um, <clears throat> I know that the E series and the M series are scheduled to be available in the March timeframe. So pretty soon. Uh, the P series, which is their UHD or what's so-called 4K uh, sets, the their entry level 4K, I should say. Uh, I don't remember. I think they said second half of 2014 and the reference series, which is the one I'm really excited about. Um, probably again, second half they say, but that's a very wide window and I don't expect it until late in the year. <clears throat> um, let's see the gadget priest. Uh, can you explain what DLP is? R E the projector I asked about last time. Well, I don't remember the projector you asked about last time. Sorry. I, <clears throat> Please forgive me for that, but uh, DLP stands for Digital Light Processing. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't jumping on the thing there. Um, stands for Digital Light Processing, a technology developed by Texas Instruments. And it's quite amazing, actually. <clears throat> it's a chip. Pardon me. It's a chip like any other integrated circuit, but on the surface of the chip, it's covered with millions, literally millions of tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic mirrors that are individually adjustable. And they either, uh, they can be pointed in one of two ways, this way or this way, say. And when they're pointed one way, the light that's coming from the lamp or the lasers or the LEDs or whatever uh, uh, is reflected towards the screen. When they're pointed the other way, they're not. Keep going, you got time. Okay. <laughs> um. So anyway, um, that's how DLP works. And, and these mirrors jiggle back and forth really quick and give you uh, each pixel or sub-pixel of information. Uh, let's see. Infinite asks, uh, does putting objects on speakers, maybe a picture frame, or partially enclosing speakers like in a bookshelf affect the sound quality? Uh, the answer is no and yes. <laughs> putting something on a speaker, unless it's something maybe that'll rattle if the speaker vibrates won't affect the sound quality, but putting it in a bookshelf will, uh, if it's not intended to be put in a bookshelf and most so-called bookshelf speakers are not intended to be put in bookshelves because, because you're putting in, putting a cabinet in another cabinet and you're affecting the acoustics of, of how the sound is radiating out. So, uh, no, you don't want to do that if you can help it. Uh, Sibelius too heard Borodin, Stravinsky, Tchaikovsky, and Glazunov last night. That's right. Uh, they were playing a bunch of Russian composers last night, which was really cool. I loved how the um, opening ceremonies ended with Firebird. It was beautiful. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo before Scott. We were talking to Mike in Portland. Thanks for hanging on, Mike. I appreciate it. Are you there? Hello? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh I'm, I just installed a, a new um, uh, Windows 7, actually, finally, on, uh, on a brand <laughs> you new computer. You can, still, you can still get new Windows 7. That's the good, the good news. 
Yeah, yes. I just got it on, uh, uh, put it on a computer my brother gave me with Linux. I wiped the drive, and I put it on, and finally put on all the drivers and updated the 150-some-odd updates. I can't get the uh, system to shut down on the power savings. I can't get the screen to go blank. When you installed it, um, did you install a, cl a clean boot uh, from scratch? Absolutely. I wiped the drive completely, totally used um, D-Ban, wiped it out completely, yeah. and then started with a new DVD. So this is um, this may be something Windows 8 has fixed. This has always been a problem with earlier versions of Windows. Uh, what happens when you do the install is that the Windows installer looks at your hardware and senses whether it can support ACPI, which is what it uses for the shutdown. And it needs to install a kernel that's compatible with the appropriate sleep pattern based on your hardware. Sometimes the installer gets it wrong. I think it did in this case uh, because all modern hardware can do this. And it said, oh, your hardware can't support ACPI, so we won't, we won't give you the sleep capability. So there's not much you can do if that if if I'm correct there's not much you can do except reinstall Windows now maybe because you, it's a shame they've gone through all of the updates <laughs> but um, the, the, in order to fix this you actually have to install a different kernel there's several different the kernel is the lowest level part of the operating system and, and there's several different uh, parts of the kernel. No, there so, wasn't a choice in terms of no no it does it automatically and that's the problem. Um, do you have uh, look in your BIOS setup and make sure that you have. Uh, uh, ACPI and you can uh, you can configure it um, so tell me again you, you 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 want it to sleep when you hit the power button is that what you want oh no 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 all I'm trying to have it do is when I'm not using it for uh, to sleep just sleep minute. automatically not even to sleep just for the screen to go blank and just you've gone in the power control. settings and you've cho you've chosen that absolutely I can't get the screen saver to come on nor can I get it to go blank huh. Actually, that might be something different. Um, sounds like there's some activity that makes the operating system think it's going, it's, you're using it. Um, so when you go to the control panel, the power saving control panel, uh, you do have those options as settings. Absolutely. It just doesn't do it. Yeah, it and sounds to me like the computer says, well, he's not, he's, not, he's busy, he's still using it. I, and I don't know what to tell you. Um, uh, uh, it could be that uh, the mouse or the keyboard are generating stray signals. Um, you don't have anything running in the background, right? No, nothing. Yeah. There is a good little program, something in the chat room suggesting uh, auto runs, which is a nice little program to see what's running in the background. It would, it would, it's uh, from Microsoft. If you search for Microsoft sys internals auto runs plural it will tell you what starts up when you start up the computer and it may be something starting up although this is a brand new install brand new brand new install on an it's got an i3 it's an hp probook 4540s yeah. and everything was totally blank yeah it sounds like something is waking it up but i don't know what and that's probably a hardware issue don't i don't know how about uh, with linux did it sleep with linux um, you never no, used never, it that way. I never I used yeah. Linux that long enough to even find out. Yeah. 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 Afraid I don't know. I, I can't help you. The chat room's coming up with a lot of possibilities, none of which are particularly compelling to me. Tell you what, we do put this in the show notes, techguylabs.com. We put all the questions and answers in there. James DeRuvo is writing right now, and then Josh will come back and put the audio and the video on there. And you can go back to that. And I would, uh, if you have an idea, add it to the comments there. And then uh, what I would suggest, Mike, is you refer back to the comments in a few days and see if anybody's coming up with any better ideas. I guess updating the drivers, but, you've, you know, you've done... The thing is, it's a perfectly good, fresh install, clean install. So it's... Uh, you might go into the BIOS and make sure things like wake on LAN are turned off. Um, that means... That's set up for mostly for IT professionals so they can use... They can ping the machine over the network, wake it up, and install updates remotely. So wake on land should be d turned off. Um, I can't think of anything else, but maybe the BIOS and go in the BIOS setup, make sure uh, that power savings uh, capabilities turned on, ACPIs turned on, things like that. 
It doesn't say this is this is if you can't shut the computer down or it doesn't hibernate properly, that's an ACPI issue. And that's a that's a mistaken install. Do I have a, a commercial here, Nathan, or should I? Could oh, I do? You know, we were talking earlier about backup, and I didn't. I neglected to mention it's great to have that local backup right next to your uh, computer, but it's also extremely important to have off-site backup. Now, not everything needs to be backed up off-site. Your operating system and applications don't, but data that you don't want to lose. You know, financial records because you're doing your taxes. Uh, emails you don't want to lose, pictures, wedding pictures, baby pictures. Those should not only be backed up locally, and I think it's a great idea to back them up on an external hard drive right next to the computer, but also to the Internet, where you can get them no matter what. The worst happens, you still have a copy. It's peace of mind, and that's what Carbonite is so great for. Carbonite is off-site. You're backing up to the Carbonite cloud. It's automatic. You don't have to remember to do it. You don't have to think about it. It's continuous. It's running whenever you're online. Your stuff's always safe. You can check it by logging into your Carbonite account on any computer. Or using their free apps. You can even download files that way. And if the worst happens, you know you've got it. Best of all, this kind of protection is affordable. Flat rate. You pay once once a year for everything on your system. $59.99 a year for everything on a Mac or a PC. That's less than 5 bucks a month. And they have plans for external drives, for networks, for businesses. Check it out. Carbonite.com. Use my name, Leo. You can try it free for two weeks. No credit card needed if you decide to buy two months free with purchase. you got to back it up to get it back. Do it right. With Carbonite, Joe, Austin, Texas, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Joe. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Not not too bad. Uh, you know, just kind of staying inside, being warm, because it's kind of cold out here. Yes, it is indeed. Yes, sir. Well, what I need to do, get your advice on, is I'm looking at buying a new Mac. Um, kind of leaning towards the you know, laptop segment, either the 13-inch Air or the 13-inch Pro. Um, wanted to get your opinion on both. And uh, one of the other things I'm thinking of doing is getting an external drive to keep all my data on, like, uh, yeah. you know, iTunes so me... and videos and all that stuff, and uh, keep that separate from the internal drive, which will... Always do that. Contain Always yeah, do that. Which will only contain the OS and the programs. Every uh, yeah, I mean, okay, so I, that's okay if you don't have a lot of space internally. Um, it's not a bad idea to have have the data both internally and externally if you have the space for it. But if you want to okay. set, if you don't, so I do that. What you just described because I have an SSD. SSD, those solid state drives are very fast but expensive. They tend to be smaller. If you get a Mac Pro. Actually, or any of either of these, you may get a drive that's too small for all your data. In that case, an external drive. But in general, that's going to slow it down. And, it, and since you want it to be portable, it means you have to lug it around with you. So mm -hmm. uh, I would do that more for backup than I would do for always. Okay. okay. Difference between the Pro and the Air. Air is lighter, uh, thinner, does not have a retina display. It has a lower resolution display that may or may not bother you. Uh, but much better battery life. The 13-inch Air has literally 12-hour battery life. It's mind-boggling. So yeah, if it so, it's really designed about to be about portability, right? It's very thin, very light, very good battery life. I use my Air to, you know, travel. That's what I, that's my travel computer. But when I want the best quality, I'll use a Pro because of the resolution and the speed of the processors. Okay, that's the difference, and of course, the price. <laughs> right, right. You know, I, I I thought if I were to go with the pro, uh, I'd probably do the mid, the one that's I think fourteen ninety nine. Yeah, it's not a bad price either, is it? No, no, it's, yeah. it's not because I I kind of figured uh, I don't have a huge uh, iTunes library because uh, I have a Mac Mini right now, and that's got you know just the five hundred gig hard drive, and I don't even have a quarter of that filled. So in general, uh, especially on a portable, the idea of keeping all of your data external is. A little. First of all, for you can keep your music that way. If if you don't need to carry that around with you, that's fine. Um, okay. So this comes with a 256 gig uh, SSD, nice fast. By the way, the drives are super fast on these um, SSD. Um, that's a lot of storage. I would only use the external drive for backup, or if you found that you just ran out of space. Okay. If you run out of space, but you know, my I have a very large music collection, and it's only 30 or 40 gigs. Uh, mm -hmm. So. I mean, I'd look at your collection. If it's hundreds of gigs, maybe keep some of it external and keep some of it internal, that kind of thing. But, for instance, if you put your entire home directory on an external drive, the machine won't boot unless the drive's plugged in. That makes it a little less portable. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
And now we return you to Scott Wilkinson, <laughs> already in progress. Already in progress. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, here I here I am here. Um, we've been talking about lava lava lamps, which I have one. Uh, it's right over there. Uh, over there. <laughs> there it is. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, apparently J five J C H says uh, that. Uh, what are called rough duty incandescent bulbs can still be made, even though incandescent bulbs of, of low wattage anyway uh, are, have been um, disappearing and even legislated uh, to disappear. Uh, but uh, hmm, I'll have to check that out because I think the lamp in my, uh, the light in my lava lamp is, is kind of, um, kind of giving up the ghost a little bit there. Uh, let's see. Do you think flexible panels will be able to make that lava lamp shape? Oh, and display the lava lamp. Oh, you know, that's a good idea. Um, flexible OLEDs that you just form into the shape of a lava lamp. And like the projectors at the opening ceremonies last night, um, it would look like a lava lamp, but it's actually on the surface. That's, that's kind of cool. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Sarah Jane UK, this is a very bright t-shirt. In fact, it's kind of blowing out my camera. I probably shouldn't wear it anymore. Sorry about that. Um, James, uh, VA3JPX. Uh, yes, I am using key lighting. Um, I have two fluorescent uh, bulbs in big reflectors that are, uh, that are pointed right at me um, because I want to make sure that it looks reasonable. Yes, kilobyte, binary clock. You've got that much correct. Um, at least one of them. There are two clocks over here, over here. Here they are. Um, <clears throat> there are two of them. And one of them is, in fact, a binary clock. In fact, it's binary coded decimal, so BCD. Um, Sibelius, why so many rainbows? Well, I love rainbows. And, in fact, I'm all about color and video. And so um, rainbows are a great way to represent that and symbolize that. So that's why I have a bunch of rainbows on my set. <clears throat> I am Argar, Argtar uh, asks, do you think the curve in the new LED, LCD LED TVs are due to compensate for off-axis viewing angles or the fact that 21 by 9 panels are so long? Um, I don't think that, that the curve is to compensate for off-axis viewing angles, uh, generally speaking. Um, you're still going to get the problem. Uh, I, I think they, they're making these curved TVs uh, because they want to somehow has say, see, we've got a new feature. It's some new, it's a new thing and they can do it. So they do. Interestingly, it's only the Koreans who are doing it. Uh, LG and Samsung and some of the Chinese as well. Hisense, um, TCL, I think did it as well. But the Japanese aren't. The Panas Panasonic, Sony, Toshiba, Sharp, uh, none of those companies are making curved screens, so I, I find it very interesting. Uh, as you know, I'm sure I've said many times, I don't like uh, curved screens, at least not on smaller TVs. Now, uh, you, you make the point, I am, Argtar, uh, about 21 by 9 screens and the fact that those are so wide. And the ones we saw at CES are 105 inches. Uh, and there, the, the curve starts to make some sense, to give you a sense of immersion, uh, if you're sitting at the right distance anyway. Speaking of which, I have to say, um, just before we, just before I came on here, I was watching a little and I, of TV, and I happened to notice that How the West Was Won was on TCM. And so I went there because I wanted to see whether or not they were going to show Cinerama in a tiny little letterbox. And what were they doing? I couldn't believe it. I've never seen this before. They actually had the image on the screen with the top and bottom bowed as if you were looking at this really curved screen, which is what Cinerama originally was. But the TV station, TCM, uh, Turner Classic Movies, was actually showing that on a flat image with this huge, huge bowing of the top and bottom of the screen. It was like, what? And, and, and people walking across from one side to the other kind of changed size. It was like unbelievable. <clears throat> so uh, I, I just pointed that out because of, of the curved screen. Cinerama, of course, has had, has still a curved screen because of the immersive factor and these really wide LCD TVs, it makes some sense, but not on a 16 by 9, 50 inch or so. 
<clears throat> Sibelius 2 says, I was surprised to see all the insides of my Vizio TV being from LG. Well, that's true. Uh, at least the panel itself. Vizio won't tell you who makes their panels, but there aren't very many panel makers anymore. And LG is one of them. And they supply the panels not only for LG TVs, but also for a number of other manufacturers, including Vizio. So there you go for that. <coughs> uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Spider asks, uh, have I reviewed any outdoor TVs? I haven't. Um, but they're very popular amongst the wealthy to put a, an, an outdoor TV on their patio or whatever. Um, I think they're pretty expensive, but I haven't really reviewed any. It'd be difficult to gauge the, uh, you know, the black level and the color accuracy and, and the light output, peak white light output when you're outdoors in the sun <laughs> or even under, in the shade. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of ambient light there to, to, uh, to uh, compete with. <clears throat> Sky view seems to be a superior product to the bright view. I, I'm afraid I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, Web0139, uh, a good question. What do I think about Sony spinning off its TV business? <clears throat> I was going to write about this, and I'm not sure it's that big a deal. It's still going to be a wholly owned subsidiary of Sony. Why they're doing it that way, they're sort of creating a separate company to do their TV business, but it's still Sony. So I'm not quite sure what difference it makes other than internally, you know, accounting-wise maybe. I I don't know. They're also focusing apparently on higher end TVs. They're not going for the for the low end of the market, which they never sort of did, but uh, they've made that more explicit now. <clears throat> oh, T Terry H. Yes, the this this Boeing effect that uh, that I saw on TCM earlier this morning is called the Smile Box. Um, I don't think I had heard that before, but it's a perfect name for it. Absolutely. Um, Sibelius asks, is Panasonic not making TVs anymore? The answer to that question is no, they are not not making TVs anymore. <laughs> they are making TVs. They're just not making plasmas. They've gotten out of the plasma business. But um, they are making LCD TVs and they are spending more, all of their TV efforts on that. Probably a little bit on OLED. But they, <clears throat> Panasonic was interesting at CES. They had no 2014 television models on display in their booth at all, uh, which was quite remarkable to me. Um, Sony didn't have that many, to tell you the truth. Sharp did and Toshiba did. Uh, and of course, Samsung and LG did, but Panasonic didn't. It was amazing, actually. Um, they were claiming that they can now make LCD TVs with the same performance, the same performance quality as plasma. And they tried to prove it in a darkened room with a plasma next to a, an LCD TV prototype that they had been working on. And there you go. Thanks, Scott. My pleasure. <clears throat> See you next week. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Hour two of the Tech Guy Show. Leo Laporte here, the Tech Guy. Phone number 888-827-5536. That's 8888-ASK-LEO. Call with your question, your comment, suggestion. So uh, we were talking about Flappy Bird, the insanely addictive, really stupid game you can't stop playing free. Vietnamese developer named Dong Nguyen tweets moments ago, uh, I'm sorry, Flappy Bird users. 22 hours from now, I will take Flappy Bird down. I cannot take this anymore. Too much success, Dong? What? He then says, it's not anything related to legal issues. I just cannot keep it anymore. Then he says, ah, I also don't sell Flappy Bird. I think he means, you know, I'm not going to sell it to another company. Don't ask. And finally, and I still make games. What, what? Okay, this is obviously the most brilliant marketing move ever. How do you create demand for your silly little program? <laughs> Why? Take it off the market for a little bit. My prediction, we'll see. By my prediction will be uh, that uh, by popular demand in a couple of weeks, or maybe even sooner, Flappy Bird will be back. Now, I don't know. Maybe he runs. I guess he might have to run a server. 
maybe it's costing him a lot of money. The the stories were that he was making fifty grand a day on the ads. Seems like that'd be enough to run the servers. Or maybe he brings it back and charges a buck. Who knows? Love that. Now, uh, I asked you last week, uh, Heather, and everybody listening, to try out the new Facebook app, Paper. It came out on Monday, and uh, we've been downloading. We've all downloaded it and tried it. It's iOS only. In fact, I, I suspect after looking at it, it'll be iOS for some time uh, because it uses a lot of the features in Apple's operating system. So, uh, you know, iPhone only. I, I'm running on an iPad, but it looks fine. So, Heather, you've been playing with uh, Paper a little bit. You, you, do you like it? Yeah, I like it a lot. It's so clean and pretty and the movement and it uh, just kills Facebook. I never want to look at Facebook again. Well, and Messy the interesting thing is, it, you know, they build it as a news reading program, but really it does replace Facebook pretty effectively. So the first panel is your Facebook feed and all your Facebook friends scroll by and you can read all the same things you'd read on your news feed. If you pull it down, you have all the same settings that you would have in a Facebook app, create a post, you know, settings like the code generator. But you can also add sections, and that's where it's kind of interesting because they have sections in a variety of categories, and most of these link to mainstream media. So news outlets like CNN and the New York Times, uh, tech outlets like The Verge and Engadget, cooking, sports, that kind of thing. So you can add all of these categories to your feed. Um, I I think this is really uh, really quite interesting. It's the Facebook killer. It is fa <laughs> Facebook is killing itself. And now I have to say we're saying that kind of facetiously, but the truth is, any company that's going to succeed has to kill its existing products, its successful products, in order to succeed. I think uh, that you have to cannibalize your existing stuff. So I think it, they've done a really nice job here. What what happens is you get all of your, you know, mo I, as far as I can tell, all of your Facebook. But then you also have, if you go to your other categories, in the same beautiful format, you know, whatever else you're interested in, news headlines, tech, sports, cooking. It's better looking and it makes it so much easier to fly past the boring stuff. Right. <laughs> well, and they also hope that you will do, like, say I'm looking at the cooking stuff and I say, oh, that's really cool. You you can now like it because it's it's become a Facebook article, even if you're not following this brand. You can share it to your Facebook feed. So their hope, I think, is that by using this, users will put more real content. This is what Facebook says they want to do, put more newsy content in the feed and less of your friends. I thought that was kind of a suspect plan. But that's before I saw paper. Yeah. So you like it. Love it. Facebook has a very checkered record with its apps. Remember the Facebook Home app, <laughs> which was turned turned your Android phone into a Facebook phone? It was a huge flop. When Snapchat took off, Mark Zuckerberg personally wrote an app called Poke that did the same thing. Anybody use it? No. <laughs> Facebook Messenger, a standalone app. Functionality is already in the Facebook app. And Facebook itself started... Isn't this weird? It's 10 years old this week, by the way. Mark Zuckerberg turned 30. Facebook turned 10. And it feels old-fashioned, doesn't it? Yeah. If you go to Facebook.com and look at your feed there, it's very. it feels like it's an old-school website, not modern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that this was a really smart move from Facebook. This, If you want to try it, it's called uh, Paper. I'd search for the Apple search store. Boy, you know, it's, it's so hard to find anything on the Apple store, on the apps. What about search movie? For, huh? Did you like your Facebook movie? Oh, you know, that's another one. No, it was terrible. Did you like yours? I never watched it. Are you kidding? I loved it. <laughs> or no, well, whatever, you know. Google did the same thing with Google+. Plus. It, it did a, a look back at your year, which was fabulous. Facebook's movie, and you can see it if you go to facebook.com slash look back. Is that what it is? I think it was. Um, you can see your look back. It covers your entire Facebook life. So it's it's everything. Um, and I think it's kind of it's kind of dumb, frankly. That um, tinkling piano thing's very dated to me, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Oh. But they added something today. Edit. <laughs> you can now edit the movie, which is something you couldn't do with a Google movie, to add images that you think are more important than the images they took, which was probably a good idea. Oh, yeah. So get I think rid of face, that boyfriend, get rid yeah, of that and that's, boyfriend. Yeah, right. So you, <laughs> you really don't want to see that. How many years have you been on Facebook? Oh, um, God, that's it, seven? 
Yeah, mine, mine <laughs> because I quit Facebook, says I joined in 2010. I quit Facebook. So I did join in 20, 2007, I think, when it first went public. But then I killed everything, and so mm -hmm. I started up. So I'm, I'm only got three years on here. Hmm. It's stupid. But, I, but having said all that, I think the future is bright for Facebook, and no wonder their stock has been going up lately. Two things. One, they said we make, now make more money in mobile than we do on desktop. That's very important. And then they launched this brilliant mobile app. That is frankly the best Facebook experience anywhere. Suddenly they're, you know, I was, you may remember three weeks ago, I said, it's over for Facebook. They're dead. <laughs> they're his, boy, was I wrong. I take it all back. <laughs> Completely reinvented themselves. Now, if they just add Flappy Bird, I'd be, no, just kidding. <laughs> Randy in Seattle, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Randy. Hey, Leo. How's it going? It's great. How are you? I'm all right. I'm calling to talk about the Olympics. Okay. Where do I start? <laughs> There's a tie-in. When your grandparents wanted to learn about real live events, they would sit around their Philco GE or <laughs> Bob Punk tube radio right. and hear what's going on. Right. Now, if they wanted uh, video clips of said events, two or three weeks later, they can go down to their Saturday matinee. Prior to the main feature, they'd be uh, sitting around watching a 15 minute newsreel or so. What, what yeah, remember those? On. Yeah, those are great. Yeah. Now, today, by the way, they're all archived online now, those old classic newsreels. You can go back and look at the entire <laughs> collection of them, which is amazing. I think it's, it's archived. Amazing, that the technology. Yeah. But, um, you know, in today's uh, world of communication technology, we have access to audio, video, Anywhere around the world as it's happening, not to mention in space, the International Space Station, and even in, at Mars, we see pictures and all. Right. We, as a free nation, we, I believe we invented the television and launched the first communication satellite. Actually, the Russians think they invented the TV, but we won't get in that battle. <laughs> that's, <laughs> Seriously. That's true. We will not get in that battle. Uh, the I'm sorry. Go ahead. The, Olymp the Olympics. You're on a roll. I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I'm on a little rant here. The Olympics is open to competitive athletes around the world. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Unfortunately, I got to take a break, but you, I'm going to put you on hold because I want it. So hold that thought to be continued. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the a tech a guy. I interrupted. Uh, Oh, now I've... Well, who was it? I forgot. Randy in Seattle. I interrupted Randy in Seattle's uh, rant about the Olympics. Soldier on, Randy. Go ahead. Part two. Hey, Leo. <laughs> I'm almost done, but it does tie together. I promise. I promise. So I started to say is that the Olympics are open to competitive athletes from around the world and the citizens of those countries. Yes. There's no, There's no company, there's no entity that should own the Olympics. Oh, now every, there's where you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> every other I agree country, with you. I agree yeah. with you. Every other free country, if I understand, does have access to real-time access to the Olympics. Oh, on the internet, that's right. Here on the West Coast, we were able to watch the broadcast of the opening ceremony some 12 hours after they happened. That's during right. Prime time. 12, 12 hours, that's right. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. you would have had to watch it at 8 in the morning. Correct. Yep. Why in this day and time do we still allow the networks to have a lock on the access to the broadcast of Olympic events? I agree. I we, agree. It, this was a real problem two years ago, you remember, in uh, Beijing, uh, because uh, it was yes. exactly the other side of the world. And, uh, you know, you couldn't you would not be able to see stuff live. Well, here's the reason. I'll tell you the reason. NBC spent a lot of money, and the Olympics Committee said, okay, you give us all that money, you can have exclusive control of it. You can go watch it at NBCOlympics.com, but, of course, you have to verify that you have uh, a cable subscription. You know, it'll ask you when you, when you say, oh, I, I want to I watch this online, it'll say, well, okay, well, who's your cable company? You want a temporary viewing pass? Here's 30 minutes you can watch, plus ads, right. by the way. 
I agree. Yeah. They spent a lot mm -hmm. of money and they're monetizing it. And they got a lot of heat last year, remember, for how they did it. They still have yeah. not streamed. They do not stream the opening ceremonies. Cable does it on demand. But you have to pay for it. So, the the you know, if you have a complaint, there's only one person to complain to. That's the Olympic Committee. They're the ones who do this. They sell the rights, the exclusive national rights. Yeah, I understand why we in the U.S. are the ones that seem to be have to deal with this i understand well and you know it's interesting because i guess in canada they're showing it live the bbc yeah. did a great job in uh in yeah. 2010 of the uh or 2012 of the beijing olympics you could and and a lot of people basically what they did is they uh they ran vpn software so that they could log into the bbc because the bbc said you have to be in great britain to watch and they'd log in and they'd watch it on the bbc because you could see everything live as it happened um, Comcast and other cable companies are offering on demand. I guess Comcast is owned by NBC, so that's why they can do this. Maybe it's not other cable companies, but they're offering on demand. They say every event. Uh, I just I feel like this is um, this is the, the argument is moot because the Olympics are run by the IOC, and it's the IOC who decides what to do with this. It, it frankly, I think you have an illusion about the Olympics that isn't borne out by the facts. It is not. A great public spectacle. It is a commercial mm -hmm. event. Yeah. And it's gotten more and more so. You know, I was shocked last night to hear during the opening ceremonies that the U.S. pays its athletes for gold, silver, and bronze medals, as do many other countries. Used yeah, to be I amateur, understand. right? Yeah. So there, yeah, know there you go. It's not, it, we, it was us that were deluded, <laughs> not anybody yeah, else. Everybody else knew this is a commercial enterprise, this is an entertainment spectacle. And you shouldn't expect it free any more than you should expect to be able to see Cirque du Soleil love for free. You gotta, you gotta pay to pay to see it. Uh, and uh, so I think the uh, the really the mistake is we think we think back to the uh, you know Olympic Games that the Greeks held. We think back to this kind of magical uh, Olympics that were non-commercial. It's never been the case. Never been the case. So I'm with you, Randy. It's frustrating. Um, but you know, all you have to do is watch one broadcast and you realize how commercialized it is throughout in every respect. And the irony is of course, uh, that the Russians in effect paid to have, it's such a benefit to the country that throws the Olympics to Great Britain, to China. It's such a benefit that they pay. They build all the facilities. That all comes out of national taxes. Uh, it, I, You know, this is the interesting thing. We're in this time when we more and more expect to be able to watch whatever we want on the Internet. And it is coming. It is happening. And, of course, the companies that make money, you know, selling you premium content, the cable companies and the networks, are holding on for dear life. And the thing that they hold on to is the Super Bowl, the live Olympics, the stuff that they know you you really want to watch because that's the only thing keeping them in business. It's live that's keeping them in business. 8888 Ask Leo. I'm with you, Randy, 100%, but there's obviously there's nothing we can do about it. It's just the way it is. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it never has been any different. Chuck in Manchester, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Chuck. I knew I was fixing to get on here because I just started coughing. <laughs> oh, of course. As soon as you start right. coughing, I'm going to pick you up. You want a break? Oh, okay, yeah. Why don't you take oh, yeah. a break? I'm going to put you on hold. Oh, no. Well, I'm... Are I'm, you all right now? I got, okay. I got rid of the cough drop, so now I think I can talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've got a problem with with the sound. I, uh, most of everything on my computer is working except uh, Windows Media Center and Windows Media Player. Yeah. So, uh, what I'm content not, are you trying to play with it? Oh, uh, say again. What kind of stuff? What is it that you're trying to play? Oh, back? I, li I like to record uh, NASCAR races and stuff. All right. So you're using it as a TiVo kind of DVR to record. Oh, right. Yeah. And uh, well, let's start at the beginning. Well, I, I don't have time, unfortunately, for the I, beginning. I know. But, <laughs> I know. Uh, but if you tell me, so what's happening? Is the video's I, I, playing fine, but not the audio? Right. And uh, for a while, I could uh, record it on uh, uh, Media Center and play it back on Media Player. Yeah. 
now a media player has quit working yeah. the sound. So as uh, I either need to fix it or find something to replace uh, Media Center. Well, I'll give you something that'll replace it, which is called VLC. It's free video LAN client. It will play back anything in any format. Absolutely. No problem. No questions asked. Video LAN, V I D E O L A N dot com. It may be, however, that there's some copy protection going on. You know, we're back in this whole problem of. Uh, the content company's not wanting you to be able to do exactly what you want to do with your stuff. Uh, but I would try Video Land and see if, if you don't hear the audio in Video Land, then there's something wrong with the recording itself. Videoland.org. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. IPv6 is not an issue. So there's actually an IP address for every molecule in the universe. No, in the galaxy. Couldn't be the universe. Maybe it is the universe. All right, you ready to play? Name that candy. I think everybody will be good at this. Let's turn the sound way up. Hey, what are you doing? Don't go away. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Ready? Name that candy. Now I'm playing against somebody who's already playing. Oh, dag nabbit. Opponent canceled his challenge. He'd get probably saw he was going to be on TV. And he said, I don't want to lose. I don't want to be humiliated. But that brilliant Leo Laporte in Name That Candy. So we'll do it with somebody who doesn't know. It's me. M. McCauley from Ohio, USA. Actually, this is, this is a hard one. Because some of the candy is not normal. Taste the rainbow is the tagline for what candy? Skittles. Everyone knows that. Uh-oh. He got it faster than I did. Wow. Name this candy. It looks like, jeez, I don't know. A Twix Mr. Good Bar. Pfft. Well, we both got that one, but he got it faster than me again. It's beating me by one point. Round three. Name this candy. That looks like a Milky Way or something. It's not a Charleston Chew. It's not a Kit Kat. It's not, it must be a born. It, it is a Charleston Chew. Oh, I thought it was white inside. Dag nabbit. It's a chocolate Charleston Chew. Oh, it's a chocolate yeah, yeah, Charleston Chew. What the hell is that? It's got to be a licorice wheel. Yeah. Oh, this guy's killing me. Well, it's because of that Charleston chew. Licorice There's wheel. no chocolate. Cho you got chocolate. My peanut butter is, of course, a Reese's peanut butter slang slogan. See, he's just, he's just, uh, I'm going to have to come back on the last one. Name this candy. What the heck is that? I don't know. A score. No, nope, it's a you know bar, and he knew it. Mr. Ohio must eat a lot of candy. I'm going to mock him oh now. God. Yeah, right. Name this candy. The hell is that? I remember that. That's a curly whirly. Yep. Oh, but he got it. So he beat me. I from lose. another country. Oh. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Johnny Jet is built to travel. Here's a man <laughs> who was made to travel, our travel guru, johnnyjet.com. Are you in Sochi right now? I am not. I'm actually in. Can you see it on my shirt? First, Canada. I was reading your scarf. Sorry. <laughs> What's your scarf say? Oh, this was, from, I was in Seattle this it's week. It's a deli. It says, called a deli. No, it's Boeing. a Boeing oh, 737. Yeah. I was oh. checking out the new Silk Airplane. Oh, how fun. It was a big deal for Boeing because oh, Silk fun. Air used to only fly A320s, and now they just ordered 54 737s. It's good for America. Yes, it is. So, uh, have you been to an Olympics? I've been to the London Olympics two years ago, which wow. was amazing. Wasn't that and, amazing? Um, now, I wasn't there. It seems like a crazy thing because you can't, can you get tickets? It seems like it's just going to be hard to get around and just crazy. Oh, uh, you can buy tickets. Yeah. It's just, especially this one going on right now. I heard that, you know, even last night in the opening ceremonies, there were empty seats. Oh, you've seen the Twitter <laughs> account, Sochi Problems, where, where journalists and others are tweeting about how messed up, like the hotels weren't ready. The water. The water, the no doorknobs fall off. Uh, there are no stalls in the toilets, just toilets sitting out in an empty room. I, I saw that. And then, that and then, of course, a press conference uh, by uh, Putin's number two in command who says, no, no, you know, people are sabotaging us. We have yes. cameras in rooms. We've seen people <laughs> turn on showers and leave them on all day. Wait a minute. Go, go back to that. We have cameras in rooms. Then they dragged him off, by the way. They said, oh, nah, dude, dude, we're going to take a tour of the media center. <laughs> I'm sure I'd be in jail. We have, we have cameras showing you a turn on shower. Are you saying <laughs> these cameras in my hotel room 
He says, we have cameras in all the rooms. Are watching me take a shower? Are you saying that? <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Great Russian accent. He's the same guy who was responsible for ring not opening. <laughs> He's now in Gulag. You can now buy a T-shirt with that. <laughs> I <way>. know. <laughs> All right, so I shouldn't I shouldn't mock the problems in Sochi, um, but I would like to know. So, are you going to go to the World Cup in Brazil? I hope so. I hope to. That one's a tough ticket because it's all over the country. It's not just in Rio or San right. Paulo. It's all over Brazil. I mean, it's fun to go to these destinations, but you really don't want to go when there's a big event going on because, first of all. Everything's going to cost you double, triple, quadruple, whatever. It's going to be tough to get reservations at all the best restaurants or even go to these restaurants. And it's just so crowded and you have to really worry about, you know, getting mugged or robbed, not mugged, but robbed. And um, I just think it's always better, especially cheaper, to go to these destinations when, you know, something is going. Well, like right after, right after it. I'll give, you know what, New Orleans, don't go during Mardi Gras. Right. Are you nuts? I've been once, and that was crazy. Yeah, go during you know when to go is do during the jazz fest. That there's it's it's there's still exciting and fun, but not so crazy. Um, I think you're right. You don't go to Venice during uh, Carnival, Rio oh. and Carnival. That'd be crazy. You go a week later. A week It'll later, be much cheaper yeah. and a better experience. I'll be happy to have you there. No, go and a week earlier because you know it's depressing. I, it is depressing, <laughs> but if you go a week earlier, they're still setting up. And uh, yeah, I don't know which is worse. It's bad if you go and you see all the old I, the stands and all the trash, and you go, oh, I missed Mardi Gras. That's depressing. It all depends what you're looking for. If you're looking to save money, go after. Yeah, and if you're looking for fun and crazy and you don't mind, you know, an inability to travel around and stuff, then, then go it. during, yeah. For sure, for yeah. sure. Actually, speaking of South America, I just saw it, an email just came in right now. 298 round trip from LA to Lima, Peru on oh. Avianca. That's insane. It must be like a $4 wow. fare. Everything else must be taxes. If you go to Lima, then you can hop the train uh, to down the Urubamba to uh, Machu Picchu is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Go to Cusco. Yep. Oh my goodness. That's well worth it. A world heritage site. For sure. Yeah. And the food and in I Lima is great. Yes, it is. They, 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 <laughs> They say the don't guinea eat pig, the guinea pig. Yeah, yeah. They say don't eat Peruvian food. Eat Chilean food. The best Chilean food is in Lima. That's, I don't know. That's, if that's true. That, that's a good tip. Yeah. <laughs> but speaking of some cool technology, and we're talking about airlines, uh, British Airways. I just sent you the email, and actually, I just tweeted it out. Have you seen this uh, YouTube video? It's thirty seconds, but they have this billboard in London. They have two of them, and they actually been up for a month or two. But it's a of a baby. Or a kid walking by, and all of a sudden, when a plane really flies by in real time, it points up to the plane, and it says what flight it is. What? Yes. Yeah, so, so How does this happen? I don't know. That's what I was going to ask you. Well, but now, I'd be impressed if the baby did it every time every plane, every, but maybe every, that... Every it, BA flight that goes by, they do it, and it tells you what BA what? flight, no. the number. No. Yes. Okay, so the plane goes... Oh, I get it. It's a... A billboard, and then the kid stands up. He points, he points to the jet, and then he says, then "Look, it it's flight BA four seventy five from Barcelona." <laughs> That's cool I technology. Mean, that I, that is amazing. That's really a great billboard. So I get it. It's not. This is not an actual kid. The whole thing is done. Oh yeah, that that's the kid is just programmatically. Uh, I thought there was actually a genius child no, no, no. in a crib. Who was looking? Sorry, but no, no. This is a, this is a, this is a ad agency's doing this. That's clever. Yes, but I, I still love it how they, you know, incorporated the. Well, the we've we've seen, number. we've shown, you've talked about sites that you can look up right. and see what's going right. overhead. So. Radar twenty four, yeah. flight yeah. aware. But yeah. that is, I think, this is amazing technology. Also, by the way, since I was up in Seattle this week with Boeing and Singapore Airlines, and they, I heard about this one app, which you have to have an iPhone or iPad. It's called Dark Sky. Have you heard Love of it? Love Dark Sky, the best weather okay. app ever. It's, it's a weather app, exactly. It tells you, like, down to the minute of, of what the forecast is. Love the exact it. exact location. And it gives you all the maps and all the stuff you could ever want. It's based on a website. In fact, it's very similar to a website, forecast.io. That's a free website. So if you okay. don't have a smartphone and you want to get the same, forecast.io, you want to get some of the same information, uh, forecast.io is, uh, is very similar. It's not as pretty. I mean, Dark Sky does so many cool things. So many cool things. It's $3.99. Yeah. 
And um, yeah, I just, they, I heard them, someone talking about it. So I wrote it down. I just think, you know, it makes me want to uh, get an iPad. Actually, I'll, my, I'll just grab my wife's. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, you know, it's funny if you're not, if you're not, uh, if you don't have an iPad, sometimes you do feel like there's a certain, they call it FOMO, fear of missing out. There's certain things that you just, you just can't do. Well, you know, I had I had a Windows phone, which I, you know, I love the the camera, but it just does not have the app. So I bought the Android a couple of weeks ago, and but still, you just can't get all the apps like you can. On. You know what? You should do it like I do. You should have all three platforms. Android, I, carry, iOS. I can't be carrying it all around. I just don't like carrying. <laughs> I still carry around. You know, for that Seattle Seahawks parade, I brought my Windows phone around, but you know, you really, I'm I'm tweeting from this thing. Yeah, that's a that's a big phone too. Which one is that? This is the Sony. I, I talked about it. I oh, bought yeah. it at yeah, yeah, yeah. T-Mobile for like $600. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't let the camera is not that good. Mm. Yeah. And that's, and that's a big part of my travels. And I'm that's what spoils you with the, uh, with the Lumia, the 10, you have a 1020 too? I have a 1020 yeah. and that's the best thing. Yeah, that's what that spoils camera, you. Yeah. The, the camera is insane. Yeah. So um, what else we got going? How uh, much time we got? I think, a second? I think yeah, we got a second left. You got one more thing you want to <laughs> do? Yeah. Have you heard of a product called F Lux? F dot Lux. F Lux. No, what is that? It's a. Um, I should talk about it next week, but Natalie went to the doctor one time because she was having a hard time sleeping. And yeah. I guess what they do is it you download this program and it changes the um, the color on your computer screen. Oh, I so have it, seen that. So it dims it at night. Yeah. So you're not so, so they think the doctor said it's probably because you've been online too much because she's always online. It keeps you me. awake. In fact, you know the last thing you should do. A doctor will tell you this when you get up, you know, in the middle of the night and you're trying to sleep and you can't just whip out your phone or your tablet because that's like putting the sun in your eyes and your body goes, "I'm awake. It's it's morning." Right. So this takes care of it. Yeah. F dot L U X. If you go to justgetflux.com, you can download it for free. I agree. Very cool. Johnny Jet. JohnnyJet.com. We'll see you next week. All right. Take Happy care. Travels. Thank you. Yeah. F.Lux adapts your computer display. I, you know, I know about it and I've never used it, but. Uh, okay. I was wondering if you had it. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I've known about it. We've recommended it. I just don't like my display to dim. Yeah. Me either. <laughs> I want it to be as bright as possible all the time. Because I'm usually jet lagged and I'm up exactly. in the middle of night working. Wake me up, baby. Yeah. But uh, so. yeah, we do. I do. I have heard of uh, Dark Sky, and it is really, uh, really stunning. All right, right. good. Yeah, well, I'm glad. Love Dark Sky. I'm gonna have to download it. Yeah, yeah. Just need to get my wife's passcode. <laughs> yeah. All right, Johnny. <laughs> great show as always. Right, Take care. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Our website, TechGuyLabs.com. Once you're there, you can visit our chat room as well. Lots of lovely people. Helping me out there. My brain externalized. Marshall is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hey, Marshall, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Good afternoon. How you doing? I'm doing great. Welcome. Hey, listen, I was on a, this kind of goes in conjunction with what you were talking about at the opening of the show about going to different music blogs. I was uh, LA Weekly music blog with Safari and I clicked on a link to read about a band, and all of a sudden, my safari locked up. Oh. And I, en I ended up with this um, thing that says there's a new video player version installed, a new version now. It's from www.appround.us, and it's locked everything up. I can't oh, that doesn't that sound safari. good. Appround.us. I never heard of that one. Yeah, it's, that it's, doesn't it's, sound good. So I'm just I'm going to L.A. Video. Weekly. I'm going to go to music, and uh, it seems like it's okay. It might have now. You're on a Mac, which means it seems less likely that you're going to get bit by browser hijacker objects or something like that. These these are really almost always aimed at Windows, just because there's so many more Windows machines out there. Right. What do I do to? Uh... So does Safari work okay now or not? No, I, I did not click the OK button to Good. do anything. I yep. kind of left it locked up. So it every time it, I it probably, to, uh, by the way, was not aimed at a Mac. It was, you know, so understand that these, uh, these sites are dumb. They don't know and they don't care. They will try to install a Windows program. It won't make any difference. Uh -huh. But uh, you're not infected. Okay. But so. when, I, when I go to... Uh, 
you know, if I go into a uh, crash, a uh, force quit safari, or if I try to go to safari and go to reset, reset safari actually is grayed out. It won't even let me click on it. So then when I force quit and reopen, everything still opens the same with this uh, locked up thing. I can't, <laughs> flip on. I can't close any tabs. I can't do anything with safari right now. Yeah. How do I yeah, you want you want to you want to kind of reset Safari? What version of uh, of um, uh, uh, OS ten are you using? Uh, let's see, it's uh, ten point seven five. And when I try to throw Safari in the trash and download a new one, it says Mac. It needs it. it yeah, you can't do that. It's a it's a built in. Right. Yeah. So what 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 is there to do to? Um, not click this OK button and let it start downloading stuff. Uh, you know, I'm looking. The, the, the most obvious way to reset uh, Safari is to run Safari and say reset, but you can't do that. It won't let me do it. Because right. you can't run it. So let me, you know, and sometimes holding down the option key and opening an Apple program with the option key hold down will reset it. It does not in this okay. case. Um, I guess you're going to have to do this. Hold down the shift key. Okay, somebody's saying the shift key. Let's try it. Let's try it with the shift key. Hold down the shift key and open Safari. Because what we want to do is tell Safari, don't, well, I don't know if that's going to work or not. <laughs> um, that's what we want to do. We want to keep, you know, you could do this with iPhoto, for instance, if you hold down the uh, option key. Everybody in the chat okay. room is saying shift. Try it and see if that works. It didn't, now my Safari is working, so it didn't do anything. But they say if you hold so down the shift key while you open safari okay i'm gonna safari quit yeah go ahead and just try it i'd like to know see if this works all right, here, here we go let's see applications safari hold the shift key and click it open it up yeah see if that works let's see what happens boom you're done oh let's see oh yeah we got it it, it opened up a brand new thing everything awesome. went away <laughs> So now, going to the reset, uh, I would still just go to the reset in uh, the Safari menu and reset it. So, so what Shift key reset. does, just so you know, it says don't resume the previous session. Okay, gotcha. And that's what it was doing, right? It was reopening all those windows you didn't want. Now, here's the good news. First of all, r r uh, AppRound is a, is a legitimate music program, but I think there is a browser hijacker that poses as AppRound. It's a Windows a hijacker anyway so it would never have infected you but right. you're stuck in this loop and that's the thing that was bothering you so sh good thing to remember and i did not know this so thank you chat room hold down the shift key when you launch safari it'll say hey don't resume the previous session let's start a new one and now you can click if you wish and it might not be a bad idea uh you can go to under safari under the safari menu reset safari now you're going to lose yeah, all your yeah. bookmarks and history and stuff but i think it might be a worthwhile thing to do Okay, so you will lose the bookmarks also, huh? Yeah, well, you know, play with it for a little while and see if you have any other problems. If you don't, then don't do it. But if you do, try uh, resetting. Thank you. Have a good day. Hey, thank you. My pleasure. Sorry that happened to you. That stinks. Thomas in Vancouver, Leo Laporte, the tech guy, home of the last Winter Olympics. Hi, Thomas. Was it crazy in Vancouver during the Winter Olympics in 2010? Actually, this is Vancouver, Washington. Oh, well, so it was very quiet and calm, I think. Yes, it was. And actually... <laughs> <laughs> what, can I, what can I... It was very peaceful, Leo. The, we, we, you know, hardly anything happened. What can I do for you, Thomas? <laughs> I actually had plans to go um, to the Vancouver Games, which is local to us, you know. But didn't work out. My main issue is... Google Chrome. I've been having issues with websites popping up ads, and I want to have app lock to turn on. This didn't uh, now the first okay, a couple of things to couple of things to know. First of all, ad blocker does not block all ads. Okay, and I've uh, ad blocker has this thing which really annoys me called the acceptable ad initiative, and you as an advertiser can pay ad. This is ad blocker plus can pay ad blocker to not block an ad. Oh. Wow. I have, that I, seems like a kind of a violation of their promise, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I also have two other software extensions installed on Chrome that uh, prevents pop-up and pop-ups, I mean. Chrome does, a, Chrome, Chrome does a pretty good job by itself. 
with that. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that we've seen with Chrome, and Google knows about this and they're doing something about it as we speak, is there were a number of Chrome extensions which were sold and then the people who bought them started to use them to replace ads on the websites that you visited. So not merely to pop up new ads, but to take over websites that had their own ads and put their ads on top of them. This is, of course, highly uh, unethical. It's probably not illegal, but highly unethical. Google has killed those extensions and will continue to do so when this comes up. Um, so a couple of things. I, first of all, let me say something about ad blocking. I understand why people want to block ads. Many of these ads are very annoying. If I see another belly fat ad, I'm just going to plots uh the punch the monkey stuff like that advertisers have brought this upon themselves by being so annoying but understand that there is a, in my opinion an ethical violation here you're using sites many of which almost all of which are free they're not they're not free to run they're not free for the people who make the sites they're free for you to use the way they make money on those sites is with advertising and so when you run an ad block you're you're essentially saying i want to use these sites these free sites, but I don't want to see any ads. I don't want to pay for it. You pay for it, not with money, but with your attention, with the ads. And I think that that's a violation of, that's an ethical violation. It's not illegal, just an ethical violation. If you don't like the ads on a site, stop visiting the site. Or write to the webmaster or the people who run the site and say, your ads are awful and I'm just, you know, you've got to take them off or whatever. But I, I'm not crazy about the idea of ad blockers. Now, there's also the issue of safety and David Bix in our chat room points out that sometimes ads can have malicious software in them. This has been a problem lately uh, because many ad, many sites sell ads in an automated fashion. They don't check them. But I just think you probably shouldn't run these ad blockers personally. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Hour three of the Tech Guy radio program is on the air. Our phone number, 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, outside the U.S. Please just use Skype. It won't cost you a penny. Skype out. Call 8888-ASK-LEO. Our website is techguylabs.com. And uh, you'll find lots of answers to your questions there, by the way. Tech guy, uh, please hold. Hello, tech guy, please hold. That's Heather Hammond, the phone ranger. She's taking your calls. Heather, who should I... Uh, should I talk to now? Speaking of, uh, let's talk to Bill in L.A. Let's do it. Hi, Bill. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Great. I just want to do one thing. I want to push a button and record this. I'm going to ask you a technical thing, and I can't write it down fast enough. Well, don't worry now. Here's, here's the beauty part. You go to that website, techguylabs.com, and we put audio and video from the show up there. In a couple of days, you'll be able to – you don't have to record anything. You'll be able to go back. You'll even see – you know, the section, it'll say Bill in L.A., and you'll be able to go right to it and watch it again. Plus, we have text. That's cool. All right. So record if you wish, but it's not okay. necessary. Well, I'm old tech, you know? <laughs> Press, plus <laughs> old, play old and record and old, at the same time. Okay, go ahead. Old guy and old tech. All right. If it was me, none of those Bordeaux would, would ripen in time. Um, I had a question about something I saw in a catalog. And by the way, good Russian imitation you did. Thank you. I like that. Uh, Spasibo. <laughs> I saw a long-range Wi-Fi advertised in a catalog, which I can't find now, but it, would, it said it would pick up up to 1,000 feet away. And I thought, gee, that would be perfect for my little house here. I can take it when I'm traveling and not have to worry. Am I exposing myself to anything? Nope. It's the same as, uh, you know, if somebody's on your curb with your regular Wi-Fi. But I should point out this issue. Uh, you actually said it when you said it will transmit a thousand yards away won't receive so that so that's the problem is you have to have it on both ends oh think about it right you you, you can pick up a signal from a thousand feet away but you still are transmitting with the same old transmitter same amount of wattage and everything it won't send it a thousand feet away so it doesn't exp it doesn't extend the distance a thousand feet it just it just receives a thousand feet you can buy Wi-Fi extenders that will extend it a great distance. In fact, I'll give you a couple of websites uh, where you can buy this kind of stuff. Great. But um, so, tell me what you're what you're trying to do. Well, I'm just trying to 
to tell you the truth, I'm, be, I'm being a little cheap here. <laughs> I don't have a lot of money, and I've I've had uh, uh, internet prov- service providers before, but I don't use a computer that much, and to me, it's really not all that much worth it. Right. So once in a while, when I want to check out something or look up something, I, I need to go to a computer. But I'm not a big computer. Are, guy. are you going to use this to borrow your neighbor's Wi-Fi? Well, there's places that have it up the street. Uh, not necessarily free. Free Wi-Fi, like the coffee shop down the street. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this won't help you because uh, <laughs> it's kind of a one-way thing. You'll be able to see their signal, but you won't be able to send anything back to them. Which me, uh, translate that for me in terms of because I I don't know exactly what that means. Well, it's uh, a Wi-Fi uh, access point is a transceiver. It transmits and receives. Yes. Yeah, these antennas receive, but they don't transmit a thousand feet. Now we can we can extend it, but generally it requires the cooperation of the of the extending party. <laughs> oh well, I don't want to do something that's unethical. <laughs> it's not. Yeah, it's not. Well, it's. It, I guess you could say it's somewhat unethical. But e- even if it weren't, you still have to go to the coffee shop and say, "Excuse me, I'd like to. Add, I'd like to extend your Wi-Fi network so I can re- I, I can reach it." Um, and they probably would t- have a, maybe a qualm or two I see. about that. So oh. no, these Wi-Fi extenders will not do what you just described. They won't do what you want them to do. Oh, okay. okay. We've played with a few of them. Somebody in the chat room is mentioning the super Wi-Fi USB adapter from C Crane. Uh, we played with it for a little bit. Does not. How far? A thousand feet? How far away is this place? It's probably about five hundred feet away. Yeah, it won't even. It won't go that far. Does that mean I cannot? Uh, I can't use it to surf the web. I couldn't get my. No, you can't out. do anything with it. You could hack them. <laughs> you can't. You could. You could see what they're doing. You can't do. Any, you can't talk to it. Here, I'm going to suggest you visit Freedom Pop. Now, Freedom Pop. Yeah, this is a free internet mobile service, ad supported. So, for occasional use like yours, if you're cheap and you don't want to pay for it, um, you know, it's not. It's not going to be comparable in speed and performance to a, uh, um, you know, your own internet service provider, but it's pretty cool. It's Now, you do have to buy the device, but the data is free after you buy the device. So I think this is a very good choice. A lot of people use it. Um, it at freedompop.com. Uh, you can also, you could buy a Wi-Fi uh, you know, device from your phone company, a Mi- they call them MiFi. But that's going to be thirty or forty dollars a month. This is free once you buy the hardware. Probably a better way to go than to get some <laughs> super duper spy antenna to reach the coffee shop down the street. I think that's they probably not might not appreciate that too much. Martin in Los Angeles, <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Martin. Oh, hi, Leo. I didn't hear my name. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thanks. Love your show. What can I do um, for you? Okay, I just bought a new computer in November, and um, I, um, when I'm on the internet, I get a message that says, um, Microsoft antivirus, hold on one second, I took a picture of it because I wanted to get the wording right. It says, Microsoft antivirus found critical process activity on your PC. You need to clean your computer no. to prevent the system breakage. No. <laughs> Uh, that's, a, that's a that's a bogus pop up of ever I heard one system breakage. What what does that even mean? Exactly, that's what when I read that's somebody that, somebody somebody from uh, Romania wrote that. That's not English. When you, okay. Whenever you see kind of bad grammar in a pop up that claims to be from Microsoft or some legit, you know it's a it's a spot. It's bad. So now yeah. having a pop up doesn't necessarily mean you're infected. If you're uh, in your browser, you see pop ups all the time, right? Yeah, but this one's really suspicious because I tried to close it right when it came up, and then um, it kind of like took over my screen, and I couldn't I couldn't even turn the computer off anymore. Oh yeah 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 yeah. That's fine. All of that can happen. Um, what, and, what, what what are you using Internet Explorer? Yes. Yeah. How did I know? <laughs> you're what, good what version of Internet Explorer? We call it Internet Exploder. What version are you using? I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you're getting this stuff because you don't have an up-to-date system. I don't think you've been compromised. That's the good news. However, because you're not up-to-date, you're going to get compromised. So the very first thing you want to do is run Windows Update. When's the last time you did that? 
Well, the computer's new. It's only three months. Yeah, but it should do it every month. Um, and, and, and one of the first things it's going to do is offer you IE11, which you should probably avail yourself of. You should also, because, um, uh, yeah, these updates come out every month. You should also, uh, I would suggest using an alternate browser, probably Chrome. It's safer. You won't get these pop-ups anymore. Um, and I'm not, you know, I know people use Internet Explorer because it comes with Windows. It's not a good idea in general. Use it if you have to. Um, but so run the Windows updates. Make sure they're turned on. They're automatically updating. You also want to update anything that goes on the Internet. That means Flash. That means if you have Java, you, sh you know, you should make sure that's up to date. Adobe Reader. Anything that can be launched by a browser should be updated. These are really critical. And then I would go to google.com slash Chrome and download and use the Chrome browser. You, this, first of all, the first thing that will happen is you won't see this pop-up anymore. Chrome blocks them. Um, if, if you had some malware installed, I suspect you don't, but if you had some malware installed, well, see, here's the deal. You go to a website that's got uh, some shady stuff on it. It can make that pop-up come up. It can do all the things you described. It can crash the browser or prevent you from closing it. it. can prevent you from closing the window. All of that can be done via a website. Your browser should block it, i.e. does not. So use Chrome. You won't see it again. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO is the uh, number. One more thing, and I, I uh, should have mentioned... Um, if you're using Windows 8, you don't need to do this. Windows 8 has the uh, Microsoft Security Essentials built in. They call it Windows Defender. But if you're using any version of Windows prior to 8, Windows XP, Vista, uh, Windows 7, you should download Microsoft Security Essentials and install that. It's free. Win at Microsoft.com slash Security Essentials. That'll help with those kinds of pop-ups too. Very helpful. Alan in San Diego, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Alan. How are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing well. How are you? All right. Just got a little problem with uh, my iPhone. Okay. All right. My uh, son had an iPhone, and he decided to switch over to an Android phone, so he got an HTC One. Oh, good man. That's a nice phone. Well, now every time I message him, it says message not delivered. The only way to get a message to him is to go into uh, my iPhone, turn off iMessaging, send in the, the text message, yeah. and then... So because back. he but, used to have an iPhone, his contact entry in your con in your address book says that he uses messages. you got to go to not your, not your entry, his entry, and uncheck messages, and then he'll start using SMS. This is a very poorly implemented, very poorly designed product from Apple that assumes everybody in the world uses Apple products. Right. So he, I have to go into his phone? No, your contacts. My contacts, his phone, and take off the iMessage? Yeah, tell him. To, there's a, there's a check. I haven't used it in ages, but there's a checkbox. I'll have to look and see. That says you can use iMessage with him. Turn that off. You used to because he used to have an iPhone. And if you all have iPhones, it's nice because it doesn't use SMS. It uses the Internet. But I got to tell you, uh, it really causes problems when somebody leaves the iPhone, which is probably Apple's intent. What? Right, they, what? You didn't want to? We're going to. I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. No one will ever be able to message you again. <laughs> Uh, so it sounds like a simple fix then. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I'm trying to, I'm looking for my contact so I can tell you where it is. But I think if you look in his contact entry, there'll be a, uh, a box, go to edit that says, let me see if it says something like you can use messages and just say, no, you can't use messages. And uh, then oh. it'll just use SMS because it doesn't okay. know. See, it doesn't know. He has no idea that he's left the iPhone. I see. Yeah. Okay, well, thank yeah. you so very much. I appreciate it. That You're very welcome. Simple. Sure, Alan. My pleasure. Yeah. Have you too. Mary in Vista, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Since my son installed the latest operating system on my iMac, it's running <laughs> slow. My son very, very slow. ruined my computer. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not here to fix it, and I, frankly, I don't think he could. But what can a dump like me do to fix it? 
<laughs> well, I'm not sure why it's slow. So he, you were running Mountain Lion, and then he moved you to Mavericks. Is that what happened? Yeah, it's Mavericks now. Yeah, and that, normally that's a fine thing to do, and it shouldn't actually slow your computer down. There have been some bugs with Mavericks, um, but slowing your computer down is not one of them. Maybe it's coincidental. I think it probably okay. is. I think it probably okay. is. So, um, you, you mean slows down how? Like uh, when you first turn it on? or Well, pretty much always. Once in a while, it'll be fast like it used to be. But usually it takes a long time for anything to come up. My mail, uh, 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 yeah, Chrome, anything. Uh, it's it's uh, probably very, it's several seconds. Yeah. If not a minute or something. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, um, it, you know, most likely it is coincidental. And it's fact, your hard drive is starting to go. Okay. Um, that would be, that would be about the only thing that could account for that big a difference. There might be a small difference between Mavericks. How much RAM is in your system? Do you know? Yes. The RAM is, would that be memory? Yeah. Okay, it says two gig, two gigabyte, eight hundred megahertz DDR2 oh, SD RAM. That could be it. <laughs> That's a little low. <laughs> That's a little low. Well, could I go to the store and buy more memory? Yeah, or you could go online. How how uh, how old is that computer? Oh, uh, it's it's old. It, Two thousand eight. Yeah, you need you need to put uh, uh, four gigs. You need to double that amount of RAM. I think that might make a difference. Okay. Do you see the beach ball, the spinning beach ball, or does it just take a while? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It, yeah, it's that beach ball. Oh, yeah. yeah, I see that all the mm -hmm. time. I hate that beach ball thing. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's not a lot of RAM. Um, I do believe that Mavericks wants four gigs minimum. Okay. So that'd be the first thing I'd do. If that doesn't fix it, then I would try a clean install. So okay. what he did is he just upgraded, which normally uh -huh. is fine, but sometimes cruft left over from older operating systems can cause problems so a clean install would be to drag the data off and erase the drive and start over okay now do you he think could do that he could do that or a store could do that okay okay so so it's, it's called a clean install clean install of mavericks okay For, so first i'll do the four gig thingy and yeah, it's not I'll... too expensive. Now, somebody in the chat room is saying he uses Mavericks on his MacBook Air with two gigs and it runs fine. So hmm. I don't know. That's a lot. That's not a lot of memory. I gotta say. Uh -huh. it, and it, so, in, in other words, it's hard for me to say exactly what's wrong. It could sure. be the hard drive is a little flaky. Could be more RAM would make a difference. It certainly is a, on the low side of how much you want. Okay. Um, I believe it's below the minimum. Uh, and then finally, if none of that helps, a clean install might. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and a store can do that for you. Getting more RAM, the Apple, you, you, are you near an Apple store? Yes, I am. Yeah, I'd take it to the Apple store. Say, what's going on? And I think that they, they will also have some good suggestions for you. Now, if they do a clean, or if I get a clean install. Back up your data first. Right. Now, I do have Carbonite, so would that. Oh, you're fix, golden. Would that be fine? Yeah, you're golden. I don't have golden. to take anything off, do no, I? No, no, you don't. Okay. All right. All right. Sounds easy. Yeah. Sure, Mary. Well, it's not completely easy. Your <laughs> son, know. your son should have fixed this. He <laughs> took, he installed, and he took off. That's the problem with geeks. Beware, yeah, geeks bearing gifts. I know it's a good thing we love them. <laughs> you know, I do this to my mom all the time too. <laughs> She's calling on that other tech guy saying, "My son <laughs> ruined my computer," <laughs> and then he went back to California, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> Yeah, that's my story. Yeah. <laughs> Her name's Mary, too. So, Mom? Mom, is is this you? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Bill in Thousand Oaks. Hi, Bill. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. It's not Bill. It's uh, Satbeer in Victorville, California. Hi, Satbeer. Yeah, hi. Bill, you're next. Um, okay. Um, my problem is, I think, you know, you already mentioned a similar kind of problem. Uh, I have... Um, um, hold on a second. Hold on. I, I knew I shouldn't have picked up. We got to take a break. Up here. Hold on. You're first out of the out of the barrel when we get through this uh, bottom of the hour here. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Ladies and gentlemen, John Slanina has informed me that this show is not brought to you by my lovely voice, but in fact, by Gazelle. Hey, do you have an old iPhone, iPad, old uh, iPod, maybe a Samsung Galaxy S3, something you want to sell? Get rid of so you can buy the new one. If you want to upgrade, you should know about Gazelle, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com, the best place to sell your old gadgets and get cash. 
Couldn't be easier. And the thing I like about this is you get 30 days to pull the trigger. So go now, because I'll tell you what, this, this, this is not, your old iPod's not gaining in value. Oh, it's an antique. You're going to love this Nano. It's not. If you've got an old iPod Touch and you think, I would like to get rid of this thing and maybe buy an iPhone, here's your chance. Because uh, you go there, you say, oh, that's in good condition. Not perfect condition. Uh, no engraving. Calculate the value. 77 bucks. Now, here's the deal. You don't have to do anything. you got 30 days to do something. In fact, what I do is go back and say, well, golly, if I get that for that old um, iPod Touch, what can I get for my old iPhone 5 on AT&T? 32 gigs. 200 bucks. 200 smackaroos. So here's the deal. Go and get all of your stuff. Empty out that drawer. You got an old BlackBerry lying around? They'll buy it. An HTC, LG, Motorola, Nokia, or Samsung phone? They'll buy it. Once you get all the stuff together, you can put it and they will send, pull, pull the trigger then, you know, and they will send you a box, prepaid, postage, paid. You pile it all in there, you send it to them, and then they send you money. It's kind of magical. They will send you a check or a PayPal credit if you need it right away. Or if you've got, if you do a lot of Amazon, I would buy, I would get the Amazon gift card because they add uh, at 5%, just right out of the box there. I guess they're returning their affiliate rebate or something. Gazelle.com, do it today. It's the best way, risk-free, to get cash for your gadgets. Free shipping too. All those offers good for 30 days. You know, Gazelle's paid more than $100 million to over 700,000 customers just like you. Take advantage of it right now. Gazelle, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot -E com. Victorville, California, Satbeer on the line. Hi, Satbeer. Sorry I had to interrupt. Go right ahead. No problem. Okay. Um, what it is, I have Windows Ultimate as my operating system, and I do have Windows Essentials on it. But for some reason, there is, um, there are, I don't know whether these are pop-ups or what, but it says, you know, reminder, your computer is not back, backed up. Back up your files online. Yeah, that's that's actually normal. That's the Microsoft Security Center, and you can tell it to stop doing that. <laughs> how, how could, how could I <laughs> if you go into the Security Center, you'll see. You know, it's in the little. It sits in a little system tray. It's got a little pennant, little flag on it. You right click on it, open the security settings, and you'll see the Security Center. You'll see in the settings there. You could say, "Don't bother me about that." There's a couple of things that bothers you about vi antivirus, keeping the antivirus up to date, backup. And system update, I think, are the, th are the three. So uh, you can turn off any one of them. The only one that I wouldn't... Uh, the Part of the problem is unless you use Microsoft backup, it doesn't know. So you can be using Carbonite, for instance, and it'll still say, you're not backing up. Well, you are. Um, uh -huh. But you're, doing, you're not using a Microsoft solution. So no. I pretty routinely will turn those off. It's in the but security There's, there's another um, message there. It says... Earth, and there's uh, earthquake detected in uh, nearby Victorville or something. <laughs> really? I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, it's something else you installed. Uh, that's I don't think that's a uh, built-in Windows feature. Right. Um, there's some. There are programs that will tell you when there's earthquakes. I don't know. Do Maybe Google Earth. I don't know what you have installed. But uh, so yeah, so I would guess that's probably also in the system tray. Those things are watching. Oh, okay. All the time, and it's, that one's probably harmless. I don't think any bad guy would. Would give you earthquake updates. So go to control panel and go to system security and. It's called a security center. Yeah, it's also it, it, you should in your you know in, you know you got taskbar at the bottom of the window in the lower right hand corner. They call that the little system tray. You should see a couple of icons there. One of them is a little flag. That's it. And you right oh, okay. if you right click on that, uh, you can open the. That's a, probably an easier way to open it up. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All right, then. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Good to talk to you, Satbeer. 8888 Ask Leo, 888 827 5536. That's the phone number. Chat room, uh, you know, we were looking because we, we, we I, I, I was talking earlier to a fella. His uh, son changed from an iPhone to an Android phone, and he can't get messages through to the kid because it, he's using Apple's messages program. And messages tries to use the internet, but it has, but it only works if you're talking to another iOS device. And apparently hasn't figured out that his son is no longer using an iPhone. Uh, I want to correct what I said because I think this is more accurate. Um, you do go into your contacts, your contacts, and you look at your son's entry. You can edit it. And apparently the key is, and this is a little more subtle and a little less obvious, you have a choice where you see the phone numbers of the kind of phone number. One choice is iPhone. 
If it says his iPhone number is this, and it probably does because it was an iPhone, change that to a regular cell phone or mobile phone. It will then say, oh, it's not an iPhone. Dumb. But I, I don't know any other way to do it, actually. It makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, 8888 Leo. thank you, chat room, for that uh, update. So uh, make sure that you, and that's another thing, make sure you're using a phone number to text him, not a phone, not an email address and so forth. It's t it, it, Apple really makes it a little sticky. They don't, you know, they don't want to make it too easy for you to leave the iPhone behind. Bill in Thousand Oaks, now you're on. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Bill Jackson. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you, Bill? Thank you. Very good. And I have a question. I bought a Seagate uh, four terabyte external hard drive. I have two other computers that I want to do a mirror uh, backup. And is there a way to partition that four terabyte Seagate in order to accomplish that? I'm not sure, sure how to do it. You could t partition it. I wouldn't even bother with that. I just make four folders. And uh, and do the mirror into those folders. Unless you're saying, right. how how are you going to do the mirror? Are you going to use a a, a disk cloning program? Well, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I also have Carbonite, and they said that they have a way to do it. I guess they could assist me in doing it, but uh, I I don't know if there's a charge for it or additional charge. But yeah, they can um, do it. But this isn't that complicated. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So you, what you need to do is you need to put a backup program on each of those four computers. Um, right. My recommendation: there are a number of programs that will do this. But the, I, I gather that the idea is you have some data on one computer on a computer that you want to mirror. You want to make sure the duplicate of that data is on a backup drive, right? And then you want to go to the right. next computer, do the same thing. Next computer, do the right. same. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. It's so, my understanding that the mirror. Um, allows you to reload your programs, too, right along with the data. Ah, that that's you, different. Uh, okay, so now if that's your goal, okay. yes. uh, that is, in fact, cloning the disk. It's not as good a backup strategy because you're ba you're making an exact copy of the disk, and every time everything ch anything changes, you now need to make a new clone. You back that's up fine. the whole thing just to back up that one file. So generally what I recommend is make a clone of, of, of uh, the disk when you first get it set up, with all your apps okay. and the updates. Periodically, you'll want to update this and run a backup program to back up files that have been changed since the last clone. That way, oh, oh. restoring is a two-step process. You'll restore the clone, and then you'll restore the files that were changed subsequently. From Carbonite, is that correct? You could use Carbonite, or you can use any backup program since you have a local disk. Carbonite's not local. Carbonite's cloud backup, right? Yes. You would use it in addition to that. Uh, but you'd have to have a Carbonite account for each of those four computers. It might not be economical. It might be more sensible for you to I'm just... sorry. Maybe, maybe you misunderstood. I have two computers that I'm... Two I'm computers. Going to be using this. Same yeah, thing. Yes, sir. Each needs a Carbonite account. Okay, but I do have a, both... I have a Carbonite account, so... Oh, well, then you're golden. What do you... You don't even have to worry. You're okay, already good. doing it. Now, yeah, so okay, so let's talk about this clone thing, because that's what Carbonite is not doing. So okay. it is... And the problem is... Let's say that hard drive in one of those computers died. To get it back to where it is today, you'd have to reinstall Windows, then you'd have to find all the app disks, reinstall those, then restore your data, and it could be a weekend shot. So it's very common, especially in business, but I do this too, to make a clone of that drive. Once you got the drive the way you want it, mm -hmm. you can use a cloning program. There's lots of them. Um, the one that Steve Gibson, my hard drive guru, recommends is called Disk Image XL. Uh, I use a one called Drive Snapshot. We'll put links in the show notes to both of those. Okay. Um, so that you said disk, disk image. Uh, disk image. Uh, let me give you the address for the website so you can. Uh, it's disk image X. M maybe it's XML. That's it. Drive image. Sorry, my brain oh, is not as good image. as it was. Drive image. It's from runtime.org. Oh. And what it will do is it will. Um, Make a clone, kind of like a freeze-dried clone of your hard drive, including the operating system, all the apps, all the updates, everything into a single file. That file you can make onto, in fact, it's a very good idea to make it onto the external drive. You can do that for both your computers. And then if one of the computers dies, you can restore that clone. Now, this isn't going to work on a different computer because you're also backing up drivers, all the all the hardware specific stuff. So this image well, is made specifically for that computer. Okay, and I will be able to partition uh, 
so that I can use half the the, the external hard drive then? Uh, you don't have to partition it because um, uh, it will make a file. So you just back up that file. There's no need to partition. Okay. You All just right. it, So there'll be one, you know, you can name it. Hey, this is clone from, uh, you know, February 8th of uh, Computer 1. And name it okay. that, and then you restore that. And the software to restore it, we'll keep on that external drive as well. It'll see speed things up a little bit. Runtime.org. Runtime.org. It's a good one. There are many of these, but that's a good one. Right. Runtime.org. You're a genius. I appreciate your help. <laughs> no, no just, just an old man who's done this a few times. We used to do this on the TV show many years ago. Uh, we did a live uh, computer help show uh, called The Screensavers on Tech TV. And, of course... It's live. If a computer dies, you need to get it back as quickly as you can. With these kinds of clone images, you literally can get it back during a commercial break. That's sweet. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. If the creeks don't rise and God is willing, the tech guy show will be back again next time right here on this here station. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Last segment of the show. Now, I you probably heard a fairly high-pitched noise during the last call. I don't know what I didn't know what that was. We had a little conversation here. Apparently, all the phones in the building went off. We're having some severe rain. By the way, Dickie D is wow. here. Dick D. Bartolo, the Giz was. And I didn't realize this. I, I, I'd, I'd seen it in newer phones, and I guess that they're now putting them in all the phones. These uh, emergency alert capabilities. So in my Android phone, when I go to settings, uh, in under wireless and networks, there's a more setting. And at the very bottom there, emergency alerts, I have... I can uncheck them, but you can have emergency alerts for... It says, show extreme threats... Display alerts for extreme threats to life and property. Show severe threats. I don't know what's the difference between a severe and extreme, but show amber alerts, child abduction emergencies. Turn off notifications. And you can turn anything off except a presidential alert. That's, well, hopefully that'll never happen. I'd hate to get that one. Yeah. So uh, I, I did, we, we got a flood, a flash flood warning. So I just want to let you know if I'm suddenly swept away. The creeks are rising here. Wow. So, oh, my gosh. No, I, no, I just looked on mine. I have um, almost out of cupcakes alert. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Fairway has to pee alert. Yeah, yeah. That's his dog, uh, by the way. Yeah, right. <laughs> just in case right. you didn't know. Yeah. Right. And battery on boat is dead. Get down there now. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if you could craft your own alerts? That would be great. Yeah. I mean, that would be uh, great, you know, actually. Uh, where we are, we're not going to have a flash flood, I don't believe. But, uh, Nevertheless, I would I would like to have some own. Yeah, I think yeah, almost out of cupcakes is a very important alert. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, actually, I have Myra who reminds me of that. <laughs> so it's okay. Dick D. Bartolo joins us every week at this time. He's Mad Magazine's maddest writer, the Gizwiz. We call him because he's a gadget hound and he always brings crazy gadgets along. He does a great podcast called The Gizwiz with Chad Johnson every week on my Twit Network. But he also uh, joins us here. What what do you got for us? Well, you know, Leo, very cheap. And uh, a nice little gadget that works well. It's called Two Hands Two. Two Hands Two. And it's two. two Hands Two, okay? It's from Felix, F-E-L-I-X. And you see it's little plastic hands at the end of this device. You squeeze the device. The device opens up. It can open up to uh, 10 and... 0.5 inches, and it's to grab your tablet or your e-reader. <laughs> when you when you let it go, the little hands hold it. Do they look and like hands? The the yeah, the little plastic hands in the back, <laughs> uh, little fingers. And then as you slide it up and down your tablet, or you can even use it. I I tried it on my uh, Android uh, S4, and it works fine. And as you slide it up and down the tablet. It will either make the tablet tilt. You can stand the tablet oh, straight up. Oh, this is a up, good idea. Or you can slide it up. So it has and an tilt. infinite range of angles. That's exactly. Always the exactly. problem with these stands. It has just one angle or two. Yes. This is yeah. nice. This is and it's angle. under 20 bucks. Uh, and it's Amazon Prime. So if you use Amazon Prime member, it comes in six different colors. Uh, it's pretty nifty. Uh, Felix, two hands, two. Now, is this plastic or is it metal? It's, pl it's plastic. It's yeah. plastic with, it looks like a... It's like a, a hair stain. clip, kind of. Yeah, yeah, with a stainless uh, spring in the back to uh, let it spring closed on whatever gadget you I put in there. I this is a good idea. It's very clever. It's very yeah. clever. So it's tablets up to 10.5 inches. Becky says she just got one at Target for $7.48. Whoa! Yeah. Wow. But that was, a, that was a closeout. They were getting rid of them. 
Oh, okay. Oh, maybe maybe she has two hands. Two hands one. one. <laughs> yes, exactly. Two hands two is the one you want. Exactly. What's the difference? Do you know? I do not know. I do not know. This is actually, I've never seen this before, but it looks really clever. Well, I might get one of these uh, just for uh, the office because of these infinite number of angles. Yeah, no, it's very funny because uh, uh, this, this woman called up and described, and I said, it just sounds silly. So send me one. Yeah. Right. Sounds and just right I for said, me. Like, oh my gosh, this thing really works fine. What color did she send you? Pink, blue, black, uh, green? Uh, green. Yeah, the green's the green, kind of cool. The green thing. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty two neat. Hands. Two hands, too. Dick uh, has a great website uh, called Gizwiz, G I Z W I Z dot B I Z. And that's where you can get uh, show notes for all of the products he mentions, not only on our show, but when he appears on ABC and other places. He also um, does a great little contest, the What the Heck is a yeah. Contest. And now, for the first time, possibly ever, you can see what you're going to win because the cover was released yesterday to Entertainment Weekly of the April issue that people are playing for. This is a big deal when April, when Mad Magazine releases an, uh, uh, the cover of an edition. Yes. So, oh, it's got Lego on the front. The, Le a Lego, a Lego Alfred. Yeah. You're playing yeah. for the April edition of Mad Magazine. You just have to figure out what that is. There's 12 autographs. He autographs them too, by the way. 12 autograph copies for the right answer, 24 for the wrong answer. So I think you know what to do. Gizwiz.biz. Stick around, Dick. We'll do the Giz Fizz right after the radio show. Perfect. I'll be here. Thank you. Michelle in Orange County, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Leo. Thank you for taking my call. My Very quickly, last minute. My daughter is going abroad this evening, and she has an iPhone 4S. And apparently it's got an encrypted SIM card. So does this mean that her our only choice of plans is through how, Verizon? How, how long is she going abroad? About six months. Uh, yeah. Quickly. <laughs> Quickly go and upgrade to the iPhone 5 or 5S. Okay. At Verizon. Because they have it, an unlocked SIM card in the more recent iPhones. That means when she gets... Where's she going? Brisbane, Australia. Oh, how wonderful. When she gets to Australia, she can buy a SIM card to pop in there. It'll give her an Australian number, but it'll also give her data there. And it's much more affordable to do that than to say, hey, Verizon, I want international data. They charge you 25 bucks for every 100 megabytes. It's ridiculous. Right. So you don't want to do, you know, she wants to use data on her phone, I presume. Mm-hmm. Then I would say that she should. Now, you could call Verizon and say, will you unlock it? But I don't think the 4S, I think you, I, th I don't think the 4S had an unlockable SIM. I think it's a Verizon phone. I don't think it had a SIM at all. You have to go to the 5 or later. Okay. Now, the, the nice thing about the 5 is it is a GSM, you know, it's LTE, it's GSM, you could put a GSM SIM. They're not locked on the Verizon 5 or 5S. And so she can get an Australian SIM card. The other thing she could do is you get a cheaper phone. Do you want her to have data? Does it does that matter? Um, yeah, she's doing semester abroad. She needs yeah. 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 I would you know, get you could you could go get an unlocked world phone. But the perfect unlocked world phone at Verizon is an iPhone five. Or five S. The five is the older one. Five C would work as well. Okay. So I'm out of luck with the 4S, it sounds like. Yeah, I don't think that one had a SIM card. I don't think it was LTE. Yeah, uh, they just said that it's encrypted. And yeah. You, you know, if you do anything in there, you break it. Yeah, it's CDMA, which means it's not going to work in Australia, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Have a okay. great, have, tell her I have a great time. She's lucky. That sounds wonderful. Oh, Leo I, know. I wish I was going to. <laughs> I know, me too. The tech guy. Have a great geek week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, the Tech Guy is just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows now on the Twit Netcast Network, and you'll find them all at twit.tv. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPad on iPad Today. You get your daily dose of tech news from Tech News Today in our weekly roundtable show, This Week in Tech. It's all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next time with another great Tech Guy podcast. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.